Okay, I will call this session of Order Vision to order. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Treaty 1 territory on the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. Today on the panel with me, uh, right beside me, is Lynn Nesbitt, and uh, next to her is Richard Whitbread. The assessor today is Stephen Lawenstein, and uh, our clerk today is Katie Sutherland. We'll be hearing applications for revision of the assessment role in accordance with the Municipal Assessment Act. The matters for which revision is requested have been described in each application, and we will limit discussion of those matters. The statements that applicants or the assessor make at this hearing are sworn testimony, and anyone speaking to the matters must be sworn in. Be advised the comparisons of assessments of properties are not considered evidence of market value by the Board of Revision. The Board of Revision is appointed annually by Council and is independent of it and the City Administration. It makes its decisions on the basis of the evidence provided at this hearing and issues a written order that will be mailed to all parties as soon as possible. Please note that the Board's decisions with respect to an application may be appealed to the Manitoba Municipal Board if the matter pertains to assessed value or classification, or to the Court of Queen's Bench if the matter pertains to the application of exemptions from taxation. Should you wish to appeal, information on how to do so will be included with the Board's order. With respect to the hearing process, I will confirm the matters to be addressed with each applicant following the swearing in. We will then have the assessor's testimony followed by questions that the applicant may have, and then the applicant's testimony followed by questions. Each side will have an opportunity to summarize if they wish. Once all the evidence about an application has been brought forward, the applicant may leave. The process will repeat for each item on the docket today. The session will close after all the applications have been heard, and the board will deliberate in private and make its decisions. You will receive the order by registered mail as soon as possible. As information, all public hearings are live streamed, recorded, and will be part of the public record. And could you please silence your phones if you haven't done so already? Um, we have several on the docket, some of which will be withdrawn. Um, just so I don't ask it umpteen times, is the issue um, here, re restricted to value in each of these applications, or correct? It is okay. All right. Well, in that case, if we could have the swearing in. Street. <clears throat> the roll of the year is 2020 with a reference date of April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is $1,023,000. Uh, <clears throat> the effective year built is 1948. The wall height is 14 feet and the construction is a wood frame or wood or steel framed exterior walls. The land area is uh, <clears throat> 31,447 square feet. The gross floor and leaseable area of 24,024 square feet for a land to plan of uh, 1.31. So if we turn, let's take a look at the property quickly to get an idea of what it looks like. So if we turn to page uh, 8 of my brief, we can see the location of the property on uh, Edwin, marked by the red dot. Um, it's near the Israeli freeway. <coughs> and then further down, you can see a street view picture of it taken from Google Maps on uh, page 8. Page 9, you can get an overhead view of the property. So you can see that the access from Edwin and Duncan and George Street will take you out to the Israeli freeway. <coughs> uh, turning to page 10, you can get some side views of the property. You can see the, uh, the overhead door access on the top one that would have to take a truck to back into it from the street side. There's also an overhead door in the parking lot behind it. <coughs> Turning to page two, you can see that they are compliant and there is no sales history or subject leases that uh, have been found. Uh, page three would be 
the rent comparables. Um, these are net rents. Uh, they're net of management. It's important to note that. Um, so when we look at the comparables, they're on Notre Dame, Elgin, Jarvis, Aaron, and Henry, all within somewhat close proximity to the property. Um, the, uh, the net rents range from $3.50 all the way up to $5.74. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to note that uh, their wall heights range from, I guess, 12 feet all the way up to 20 feet, and the least areas range from 18,548 square feet up to 30,000 square feet. Um, the land to plan ratios for these um, are important for these uh, comparable properties due to the small um, land to building ratio for the subject property. So for 1857 Notre Dame, uh, the land uh, to building ratio is uh, 2.15. Uh, for Elgin, it is 5.86. For Jarvis, it is uh, 2.0. Zero 05 for Aaron, it's 1.28, and Henry, it's 1.55. All fairly similar to the subject property, obviously, except for Elgin, it's a little higher. Um, so, other things that are important to note about these comparable properties are the access they have, because the uh, subject property has quite poor access, as we can see in the pictures for backing trucks in, which is obviously important for industrial properties. So. When looking for comparable properties, I tried to find something similar. So for example, 717 Jarvis, um, you have to back in from the street, similar to the subject property. So it does block the streets. Um, other load, um, <clears throat> there's another loading dock where you actually have to drive through a uh, adjacent property to reach the dock. So it's not even on the same roll number. Um, 945 Aaron. Um, this is a similar property in that it has a very low uh, land to building ratio. Uh, everything, the whole building was built from 1945 up to 1964. There was one addition in 2005, which is why you get the um, a little, maybe a smaller jump. Oh no, the year, my mistake, the year is 1945 for the year built, but they're all 12, three, sorry, the, the 2005 was the metal frame. All the other parts of the building are wood frame. And for 1000 Henry, um, another interesting property uh, to compare to the subject property, um, to gain access to the front overhead doors, there's two of them. Trucks have to traverse through another adjacent property of different owners. Um, only one real over, overhead door uh, is, and uh, this is basically, this property is basically just used to store tires, which is why it's um, rent is so low at $3.50. So turning to page four, um, we can see our income workup. We're using a blended weight rate, rate of $4.90 per square foot to get a potential rent of $117,810. Uh, we apply a 6% vacancy to that and 2% uh, expenses and an overall capitalization rate of 9.80, which is applied to our net operating income of $103,121 to get an estimated market value of $1,052,000. So uh, in terms of our cap rate, if you look at page six, you can see the, um, our, uh, our chart, and it falls um, <coughs> on the higher end of our cap rate at 9.8. This is basically the highest cap rate we give a property. Uh, we're giving this property, uh, this cap rate due to its age, location, um, size obviously, low wall height, play a bit of a role in that as well. <clears throat> and then um, turning to pages um, 11, you can see the mailer. Um, there are some prop there are some um, tenants in this building. Uh, page 12 shows that. Uh, they have the states they have month to month leases. Um, so, and then it states that there's also a vacancy of 15,407 square feet. Um, page 13 is our capitalization rate um, evidence. Uh, the industrial charts at the bottom chart that ranges from uh, 497, 4.97% uh, uh, up to 8%. Uh, these are examples of actual um, cap rates in the market. Uh, they're not used specifically for comparables for this property, but they're there to show that that is a range in the market right now for industrial properties. 
And then our non-recoverable expense sampling is on page 14, which shows you that 2% for non-recoverables is more than adequate for, uh, uh, for the, uh, the income evaluation. So we feel that this assessed value at 1023000 is fair and equitable and should be confirmed. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. On page 11, mm -hmm. uh, we see that the property had 64% vacancy. Uh, did you look at any of the other expense mailers previous to this to see that there's a high vacancy rate on this property? Um, we are aware that there is a, a high vacancy of this property. Um, I believe two assessments ago we asked for inspections to confirm this. We weren't granted access. Um, so it, it's hard to determine for us if we don't get inspections to be able to confirm that. We're not saying it's not true. We're not saying it isn't true. We're just, we would like to get an inspection of the property to confirm everything. And who did you ask for that inspection? I believe it was a colleague of mine last, uh, the 2016 um, assessment for an inspection. She did walk by, she did notice some activity in the building, but she can't say how much activity took place in the whole building itself. And do you know who she asked to inspect the building? That I do not know. Okay, because I would I would tell you if she called me, I would definitely go down and inspect the building. If she would have to call the owner, the owner would have gone down and inspected the building. Okay. Because I recall from that appeal, because I did that appeal, that she just dropped in on a balance and she did get into the building because she stated so. Uh, Page eight, uh, you'll see that there's actually a, uh, there's a sign in front of the building there that says that uh, the building is 24,000 square feet and it says that there's 24,000 square feet for rent. Okay. Question? Well, with that in mind, uh, since that's there, would you not agree that there is a, you know, a problem as far as renting space in the building? Because obviously the owner, uh, is looking to rent the entire building because the tenants are about a month. Okay. Uh, when you're looking at your comparables on page three, which one would you pick as the best comparable? Most like the subject. I think I think they all show the market pretty well, um, and they all support our uh, our market rate. We have at four dollars and ninety cents. They all have. They're all older buildings, they all have a low land to building ratio, a lot of them have, well they all have pretty low wall height with 20 being the highest, they're all within the range of square footage, so I wouldn't say there is one single best um, comparable, um, and, uh, looking at the uh, comparables, I'd say they're they are all a sample of what the market is for this type of building. Okay. And you, would, uh, you stated that the uh, building was actually built in 1945 and there's an effective year in 1948. That's correct. So that effective year would mean that the owner spent some money on the property, so you bumped up that to 1948, correct? Correct. Okay. So let's go back to page three in the comparables. Sure. So you can see it's a 1948 building, yet uh, comparable one is 1973, comparable two is 1972, mm -hmm. and comparable three is 1976. Things they're so much newer than the subject property, do you not agree that they're superior? Uh, not necessarily, no. Like you said, renovations to the building do increase uh, its age. These buildings maybe have not ever been renovated and keep the effective year built in 1973. I think um, that's just one aspect of comparing properties as age. There's also wall height, leased area, uh, location. So I would say these are pretty comparable. But oh, they are, you would agree they're around 25 years or so. Well, there's no, there's no doubt about that by looking okay. at the effect of your build. Okay, that's my question. Mr. Whitbread. Well, I was going to focus on that 64% vacancy as well. Um, do you do you have any records from previous assessments as to the vacancy rate? In terms of like mailers that we are bringing or vacancy rates in the area, that I would be the 2017 mailer, 2016. Sure. Mailer. Yeah, and and from what I looked at, they do state um, that there is vacancy in the building, and I'm not disputing that there is vacancy. All I'm saying is that we would like to inspect the building, and yeah. he's, he's been willing to allow us in, so we will go and inspect it after this and confirm the vacancy. So maybe this is a theoretical question, but even if you find that, or if you find that it is 70% or 64% vacant. You so, would, just, may I finish? Oh, sorry, yeah. You would, you would input your data, and would the model still potentially put out a rent as um, you've exhibited on? The model, the model will not put out 
a rent for, for chronic vacancy. That is something we have to do individually. We have to inspect the buildings and realize that they have been vacant for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, a vacant, like 64% vacancy over one year, it could very easily be rented out within one year so, or even within a month that's gone vacant. So we're not going to put a chronic vacancy on it. So but if you found there was a 70% in 2017 and a 70% in 2016. That's just one year. Uh, well, three years. Oh, if you're if you're going back. If you go back three years, then do we, you find three what? years? We might we might start looking at that and, yeah. and considering it. But you know, the, it has to also go to market, which is showing people are they are trying to rent it out. Yeah. They are trying to uh, to get tenants in there. So there are factors involved. But yes, we we are flexible when it comes to our vacancies if it is chronic. Okay. So we have to confirm that it has been a chronic vacant building. And at seventy percent or sixty five percent, that could fairly significantly change the rental income, I would expect. Yeah, I think... With um, the model. Yeah. Um, That's a question. With, yeah, not with the model, per se. The model is not going to change because of one building having 60% vacancy. But it's something that we would look at on an individual basis. And the assessor could adjust the Absolutely. revenue. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Um, and I think I heard you say the cap rate the high cap rate was selected because of age, size, and the low wall height. Yeah, those are those would be all uh, reasons why this would be selected for sure. Um, that the model would have a 9.8 percent cap rate location as well. So those are all reasons for sure. But you're unable to comment on the condition of the building on the interior. As I have not inspected it, I can't. I can't comment on the condition of the interior of the building. Okay, that's good. Thanks. No more questions. Ms. Nesbitt. I do have a question. Um, I'm looking at page one mm -hmm. and page four together. So I'm, I just need a clarification for you. On page one, your assessed value is showing at $1,023,000. Oh, your see. workup comes down to $1,052,000. Oh, that's good cash. So, um, well, I'm going to go <laughs> with, what, with what the workup is here. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, no, that's not true. I'm going to go with what was a... Uh, so it was one million twenty-three thousand that was appealed. So that's the uh, that's the appeal value. Okay. So then the numbers then won't be accurate on your page four uh, workout. Unfortunately, no. So I'm gonna have to figure over that incorrection okay. that has happened. Okay. Do you want to take a minute to do that? Oh uh, yeah, I'd love to take a minute to do that. If you don't mind. Sure. No problem. No. Years of Looks like it would probably be our potential rent is off at the very beginning. So for that, I can't figure out at the moment what our okay. model would have. Okay. But you're sticking to the uh, one million twenty-three. I will stick to what was um, what went out for our assessment and what has been appealed. Okay. So. Okay. More questions? No more questions. Um, <clears throat> the comparable properties that you selected, uh, mm -hmm. it sounded like, regardless of age, you were really looking for ones that had difficult access, which is a significant factor with this building, am I correct? Yeah, that seems to be, um, 
an issue with this building as if we want to look at some pictures of this building here you can see um, especially on page eight you can see the overhead door um, <clears throat> along the street there so a truck would actually have to block the street to back into that overhead door which is difficult access and of course on the back of the property sort of where the parking lot is again there's overhead doors there um, that would make it difficult for them to back into um, I also look for buildings basically you know, low to building ratio um, difficult access, low wall height, all quite similar to this building and in a, a fairly similar location. So as there are not a lot of comparable properties right in this area as it's just off waterfront, it's sort of in the exchange area, so you kind of had to go out to the other side of Main Street, Jarvis, even into um, again, Long Wall and Aaron where there are similar ages and, and very compact properties. Mm -hmm. so. uh, though you have not inspected it, do you know what use or users uh, are occupying the building? Um, for the longest time, there was a, quite a long lease where Canada Goose was in there. Um, they left, I think it was in 2012. Um, stopped paying their lease. They broke their lease, I believe, and stopped paying in 2014. And at the moment, if we look at the mailer, we can sort of see there's an internet company in there on page 12 of my brief. And then there's a bunch of other well, month to month leases for small square, square footages, looks like office space consulting companies, so it's basically what it's being used for. Um, as the, the agent has pointed out, the comparable properties vary significantly in their age, some of them quite a bit newer than the subject property. Um, <clears throat> what implication is there for the value of warehouse properties uh, when you're looking at the age. I, think um, I mean, basically, people are renting space. Does the age of the building have a significant factor when really what they're looking for is so we're, we're envelope? We're, we're speaking of industrial properties here. So Winnipeg has a fairly old stock of, it, of industrial properties. As you can see, there's, in my comparables, there's some 1950, 1945 stock of 1970s. We haven't, we're starting to build more stock now, but we hadn't built it in quite a long time. So when we're looking at comparable properties, we see 1950s, 1940s, 60s, and 70s are all somewhat comparable. And we can see that in the rents as well that I'm showing here. They all, they all range in prices. Um, there's a, so 1945 is renting at $4.68, but then in 1972 is renting at $4.60. So it's, that's the market. For industrial properties at that age. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Rock. Yes, I just have some rebuttal evidence for his comparables. And I just uh, like to state that uh, I haven't had any conversations with the assessor if he wanted to come and inspect the building. He could call me and I would this year than any other previous cycle. They did pretty good at coming up the same building. So I'd like to, basically my point is that the comparables that you came up with are not really comparable to such a property. If you look at the front of my brief and take a look at that building, uh, built in 1948. Uh, it's quite an old building. It's uh, wood frame mostly. Uh, it has the interior space of the building is actually about five feet above grade. So that one door you see on the left there, if you drive in, the floor is actually about five feet higher. Sorry, what are we looking at? If you look up my, my front page in my brief, yes, that entrance door uh, runs from the front of the building to the back of the building, and the space inside is pretty much the width of that door. And the difference of height between the grade where you drive in and the interior of the building is about five feet. And there's a little tiny small lift that actually, if you put your stuff on, you couldn't put a pallet on or anything like that to lift into the building. So what we're looking at is the brown area that is the lower part in the photo. Yeah, like if you is essentially not part of the building. Well, this part here, that green, if you drive yeah. in, uh, the interior of the building is about five feet higher up this door. 
like the actual floor inside the building. The whole, the whole building. The whole building. You'll see in the yeah. pictures I have in my brief, it's actually played a lot higher. Uh, when uh, Canada Goose was in there, they actually had their uh, computer cutting machines in that area. That's why they kind of left early. They went to Winnipeg Avenue because the building, as they were expanding, the building was becoming very functionally obsolete for them to utilize. Uh, so that's why they left in 2012. Uh, they continued paying at least to 2014. Uh, and since that period of time, the owner has tried to lease the building out, he's never leased it. He hasn't leased it out yet. But getting back to the assessor's comparables, if you look at uh, number one at 857 Notre Dame, it actually has drive-through loading. You can actually drive right into the building and shut the doors, two of them. It's got two levels of office space in the front, and as you can see, it's a, a concrete building on the exterior. Uh, I think it's a superior building, and it was built in 73. Uh, comparable number two is on Ellen is actually a lumber storage building. Uh, so the forklifts drive in, uh, trucks can drive in one end and dump the other two on a little lumber. Uh, it's a storage warehouse, uh, and it's not comparable. And that was built in 76. So if you turn to the next page, the Jarvis property actually has, uh, uh, that's uh, part of Metalworks. It's actually a manufacturing, and uh, again, uh, trucks can drive in, semi trailers can drive in. You see the side door there. On the computer, you can see that there's a semi-trailer inside there. When I printed it out, it doesn't really show that. But uh, I think that's actually a concrete building, a brick building. Uh, it's got lots of office space and uh, two-story office. And it was built in 79. I think that's a superior building with the subject. And number four, uh, that building has been renovated. Uh, you can see the two loading docks you can drive up back to, leave semis there, which you can't do in the subject property. And the exterior is all been done in brick. Uh, that's a 1954 building, but it appears that there's been extensive renovation done to that building. If you turn the page, uh, 1000 Henry, uh, I would say that's not comparable, but then the rent shows that at $3.50 a square foot. It's obviously an inferior building. So turning to my brief, as you can see... We'll just, just check to see if there's questions okay. about the rebuttal. Um, have you inspected any of these buildings? No, I have not. So you don't really know the quality of them on the inside? Uh, well, I would assume that the uh, number one, that's all finished office space in there. It's actually uh, something wheelchair. I, I can't remember the actual name of the building. Uh, the building uh, below that, uh, obviously it's lumber storage, so that's an actual storage warehouse. Okay, we'll go on Mr. Ripley? No. Okay. And we'll return to your okay. So again, you can see uh, in front, that's the uh, left side uh, loading uh, door that uh, that whole side of the building you can drive through from one to the other. As Assessor stated, it, uh, it, uh, you could never get a semi-trailer in there. You'd have to use smaller uh, vehicles to get in there, which makes it somewhat functionally obsolete. Uh, there's uh, higher windows in the building. Uh, that you can't actually see it, but provides light to the building. So if you turn to the next page, uh, you'll see the location. And it was, a, at one time, it was uh, an industrial warehouse. It was constructed in 45. Uh, the main floor is, tile, is tiled. Uh, I believe that, in my opinion, it's functionally, it's become functionally obsolete because the drive-through dock area is five feet uh, below the main floor. There isn't an actual lift to take anything up. It's just a small little tiny lift. Uh, the interior space is not clear span, making the space difficult to utilize. Uh, again, the assessors talked about uh, backing uh, trucks up to either the loading docks. And we talked about uh, Canada Goose, and the, the building has basically been vacant uh, almost 100% for over three years. Uh, the current uh, tenant that Voyager Internet that the, uh, the assessor spoke about is actually a company that the, uh, owner, is part, the owner of the building is part owner of. So to turn to the next page, you'll see uh, the interior at the top. These are all actual pictures from Collier's when they were trying to lease it. So you'll see the uh, main floor area of all the columns. Uh, those are all wood. And you can see there's like a raised ceiling above that area where there's skylights so you can get some light into the space. Uh, you can see the office space. Uh, you can't see outside the windows are higher, unlike some of the comparables. Uh, the loading dock on your right there is on the uh, far side of the building. 
And uh, as you see the picture on the bottom right, uh, that's that loading area where you drive in. As you can see, it's not very wide. I don't think you'd ever get a semi trailer in there, but you could get a smaller truck in there. So if you turn to the next page, uh, this is from the assessment department. You'll see that the assessment department has raised the value of the building 40%. Uh, I think it's one of these buildings uh, that's uh, not an investment quality anymore for its age. I'm using the parameters at 6% uh, for vacancy. Uh, no, sorry, I'm using a, a little higher vacancy, but I'm using the 2% for expenses and I'm using the cap rate at 9.8%. So you turn to the next page. Uh, since the owner cannot, he's trying and attempted to lease that space out and he can't. So now he's come up with this idea uh, waterfront north. That's what he's calling it. So he's got uh, someone to put this together and put it on his website to try to get someone interested because he's calling it waterfront. It's not really waterfront drive, but that's uh, his marketing plan is to try to get someone interested in the, in the property. It's not working so far. If you turn to the next page, uh, this is from Colliers. Colliers did try to rent the property. Uh, they tried to rent the property, uh, I think, midway through 2015, all of 2016, and into 2017. Uh, they're no longer uh, listing this property. And the rent did not include maintenance and repairs, and they were asking $4 for it. <coughs> Couldn't rent it. Still can't rent it. And it's funny because they're using the back of the building, which looks better than the front of the building in the picture. <laughs> so you turn to the next page. And you'll see the, the income expense mailer. It is a gross lease. And you can see uh, that's a cat screen capture from 2018. He still has a sign out front. He's still trying to rent the whole building out. Uh, he does have a couple of tenants that are month to month. If he rents the building out, they're all gone. And the Voyager Internet will probably just, uh, since he's part owner, will just go into another vacant building that he owns. So the NOI that year is only $15,572. So there is chronic vacancy uh, going back to 2014 on this problem. So if you turn to the next page, and you'll see that uh, you know, there's still 15,407 square feet at the bottom. They're vacant. They're all month-to-month -month leases. Uh, they're basically in 2016, it was 80% vacant. If you turn to the next page, there's the income expense mail from 2017. It's 64% vacant. And the net operating income was uh, 53000 and actually in 2018, since we're part of 2018, the net operating income was only 7209 and it was 78% vacant. So we turn to the next page. Uh, you'll see I have some comparables. We're coming on Mountain Avenue, which is a superior building at 295. More modern building, built at 76. You turn to the next page. Probably closest to the building is 903 and 911 Hayden's. Uh, 90, uh, 909 and 911. 909 is the one on your right, and the building on your left is 911. And they're presently uh, still trying to lease that building out. It's built in 71, and they're asking $3.50. Uh, if you can see at the back, it is, uh, does have overhead doors in the back. It is a warehouse similar to the subject property. I think it's uh, probably comp a comparable property. And then you get 111 Ellis underneath it, which is part office and uh, storage warehouse at 395. And then you got 1245 Border, which is 375. And since uh, 2017, they have done extensive renovations in that building. I think they're asking about uh, 550 or six dollars a square foot now. But back in that day, that they were asking 375 for the back storage area, not the front. So. Turn to the last page on evaluation. I'm going with the Colliers, even though they never uh, leased it at four dollars a square foot. I think that's. Uh, I mean, you can't dispute the fact that's what they're trying to ask for. It. I'm using 15% vacancy, so I'm not using a lot of vacancy, but I bumped it up from the six percent. So when you're getting the net operating income and you get 15% vacancy, I'm using 375 for shortfall, which is the uh, city parameters. I'm using 2% for other, and I'm using a 9.8% uh, cap rate. 
which I think is appropriate for an old building like this, which again, I think I don't think is investment quality. It's obvious you can't rent that building out over a number of years. Uh, so I'm asking for uh, $678,000 for the building. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Well, a few questions. Um, so you're speaking of the, um, <clears throat> the loading docks and how they had to drive into the building. Uh, I guess page six is an indication of that loading dock. Over your brief. Um, but they also have above grade loading in this building too, don't they? Oh, yes, that'd be page seven. Page seven, so and that's not the only loading dock. No, so well, that page seven there, uh, uh, as you can see, that was built uh, specifically on uh, the side attached to the uh, main building. And I guess uh, that's great, that's almost grade level uh, loading for the building. But would that be at the floor level? They wouldn't have to lift anything up like you were speaking of before. They could just roll it right in? Uh, no, there's still a little bit of an area you have to go up. But it's that whole side of the building. is uh, It's green level for the wood part of the building. So you can see on page 7, you can see that there's a stucco part. Mm -hmm. And there's that wood part. And the wood part is on, uh, it's not actually on a foundation. Uh, that's all grade level, so you can move into that part of the building. That's grade level, just that one side. Okay. The part that's that's wood. Um, turning to page ten and your rent comparables. Um, Thirteen oh nine Mountain. I uh, I took the mailer and I I, I couldn't find uh, a single time this building was, was leased for forty for the whole building at two ninety five. Do you have information indicating otherwise? Uh, no, that came from the Johnson report. That was uh, <clears throat> uh, from the 2017 Johnson report. Okay, because I have uh, be made in there for 21,630 square feet at $6.33. And Iron Mountain was in there in 2011 to 2016 for 21,630 at $5.02 net. So I'm just saying that we can't, I couldn't find any information saying the whole building had ever been rented out for that much. Johnson report could be wrong. Okay. Um, but I'm not relying on those comparables. I'm relying on the Collier's $4 for rent. The advertisement? Yes. Okay. So none of these, because uh, 909 and 911 Higgins, I actually couldn't find, I, were you referring to 11 Higgins possibly? It seems to be that was the building. Well, there it's advertised as, as both those buildings. Well, I understand, but I'm just saying, um, 909, this is actually 11 Higgins, I believe. Is that, is that correct? Uh, 909 is on the right. 911 is on the left. Okay. Um, all right, well, finding, I believe I found the building within our mailers, and it currently is rented out at uh, $3.96 uh, per square foot, which is probably pretty accurate for that age and that type and inferior building to the one we're looking at right now for the subject property. Um, and in terms of uh, 1245 border, I actually do the mailer for that one, and uh, that's NRG management, I believe it's 63,500 square feet, and the commercial rent for that one is $4.43 at states. So, uh, what year was that one? This would be uh, started in October of 2016. Okay. So those aren't really questions, they're more just statements of things I found. Um, so aside from that, I, I have no more questions. Just quick thing. No, no questions, thanks. Elizabeth. I don't have any questions either. Um, very simple question. <clears throat> Looking at that wood uh, addition on page, what was that, seven? Seven. Um, is the for original wall still in place, and as a result, this this addition is essentially separate from the rest of the building. Not uh, wasn't opened up to the rest of the building completely. Well, there's pot, there's doorways you can get into the rest of the building. Yeah. Large doorways. Uh, about the size of the door that you can see, like see a there. twelve foot opening kind of thing. Okay. So all my questions. Thank you. We'll move on to item number two, which is 11 McDonald Avenue. Sure. Uh, 
Um, roll number 130910800011 11 McDonald Avenue. The roll year is uh, 2020. The reference date is April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is $416,000. The um, actual year and effective year built are 1948. The wall height is 14 uh, feet. The construction is a wood or steel framed exterior. The land area is um, 8,730 square feet. The gross floor and lease floor area are 8,353 square feet for a land plan of 1.20. Uh, turning to page two, you can see they are compliant. There's no sales or lease history. Again, we'll turn to page eight here and take a look at the location of the property. Um, it's on McDonald near Higgins and of course the Disraeli overpass. Um, further down, you can see a, um, a street view picture of the property. <coughs> On page 9, you can get an idea of the uh, layout of the property. Um, it's right on the corner of McDonald and Gomez with a little red dot. Uh, further down, you can get us uh, an aerial view of it on page 9 there. And again, on page 10, you can get another idea. You can see where the loading dock is. Um, Basically, they have to load the trucks in, coming in from the uh, adjacent property. <clears throat> so turning to page three of the comparables, um, they range in uh, rents from $4.75 uh, all the way up to $6.60. Um, these rents are net of management, as stated before, with all of our rents. The effective years built range from 1939 all the way up to 1962. Uh, the leased areas range from 6,000 uh, or 6,050 square feet all the way up to 11,600 square feet. And again, the uh, the areas that the location are on Ellis, Holden, Selkirk, Wall, and Logan. Uh, close to the area, not exactly within the area, but quite close. <coughs> Turning to page four, you can see we're using a net rent of $5.22 per square foot um, for a uh, potential rent of 43, uh, or a market rent of 522 for a potential rent of $43,603. Uh, the vacancy we have put on is 6%. The expenses are 2%. We're using a capitalization rate of 9.2% uh, for a, uh, a value of 416000 so again, turning to page six, you can see our capitalization rate table. Again, it's on the higher end, um, again, due to size, location, age. Um, and then turning to page 12, you can see the mailer. And page 13, uh, page 12 there. And then uh, the capitalization rate evidence is on page 13, which I've already gone through, and the non-recoverable expense sampling on page 14. So we feel this value is fair and equitable at $416,000 and should be confirmed. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes. Uh, on your evaluation, uh, sorry. on page 4, uh, you're using the same rate for, uh, rent for the basement, correct? Uh, yes, it's a blended rate. It's all together at the 8,300 square feet. And I, did you have a chance to uh, inspect the building? No, I have not had a chance. Okay. And if you're in comparables on page three, is there anyone that stands out would be the best comparable for the subject? Um, again, I feel like these are all very indicative of the market for this age, this size, this wall height. So I feel locations are fairly, they're fairly close. So there's not one particular one I would pick that is best. I feel this is a good sampling of what the market is and what our market rent is based on. Okay. Our model rent is based off of. Okay. No Mr. Whitbread. Uh, do you mind just reading? I'll defer for a moment. Sure. Isn't that it? No, I have no questions. Uh, this is 14 foot wall height. Is that 14 feet throughout the whole building? I believe it is. Yes. So, uh, what I'm looking at on your page 8 is 14.
14 feet. And, um, sorry, you might have mentioned this or not, is it clear span, not clear span? Well, we measure, 14 feet we measure from the outside, so uh, the clear span, I'm not too sure if there's anything on the ceiling that's blocking it to a, the actual true height of 14 feet. No, I, sorry, I mean, um, are there posts throughout the whole building? Or I, I'm, not, I'm not inspecting the building, you don't so, know. Yeah, so that I, I cannot say. But as you can see with the comparable rents, they're all, some are 13, some are 12, some are 15, some are 14, and they're renting. And those are the actual rents of, the, of those properties. So. Uh, there is a basement to this. That was, I was not aware of that. I'm not too okay. sure of the basement part, so. Okay, so your 522 is assuming that there is just a, a single level. Uh, yes, that would be based on the single level. So we have uh, on the front of our page here, we have uh, numbers of stories. One, we don't have anything stating the basement. So. Oh, basement. Oh, never mind basement oh, wait, area. Basement area. Oh, there, yeah, there it is. All right. Sorry, my mistake. Yeah. So that would be included in the leasable area at $5.22. Uh, yeah, $5 okay, so obviously a small basement relative to the, the leasable area. Um, do you know what uses in the main end of that basement? For the no. basement? I have no idea. All right, those are my questions. Rebuttal? Yes, sir. <laughs> May I? Uh, well, well, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. okay. It's okay. I glossed over you. You did. Here. You just walked over me. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> no, I've forgotten. Oh, okay. Here we are. Well, I knew you would. Um, back to the assessor. I'm looking at your page 12, and it's the submission by the property owner. Mm -hmm. It uh, is owner-occupied and therefore showing a 0% vacancy. Mm -hmm. um, and you've plugged in 6%, which would be the model. Is yeah. that correct? Correct. Okay. That's all I okay. wanted to know. Uh, Mr. Rack, your rebuttal? Yes. Uh, as you see from the front page of the assessor's brief, the uh, rear built is 1948 and the built the year is 1948, meaning no money has been, spilt, uh, has been spent on this building whatsoever. There are lots of columns throughout the building. It is uh, quite old and disrepair. The owners actually bought this for their RC eliminator business and uh, then they were now on one point Higgins. So they left this building and they're now they've gone to a larger location, the same kind of age. And this building is basically used for the owner's storage. So if you look at my, uh, the assessor's comparables, because the first one that he had on <coughs> Logan is actually Flame and Comfort. So that's actually a retail space. And that has been obviously renovated. I've actually been in that space uh, numerous times. I buy things from my part place in there. Uh, so that's a retail space and that is not comparable to the subject. It's a better location and a superior building. 885 Wall Street is actually, uh, you can see by the height of the uh, walls, it's actually a storage warehouse and it actually has uh, loading docks and uh, grade level loading with a large office space in the front. So that is not comparable to the subject property. If you look at 430 Selkirk Avenue, uh, that has been renovated. It's actually quite a nice building, and that's uh, mostly office. And they actually own, as you see the picture in the bottom, and I brought on uh, on the website to make sure that that parking lot, as you see the rails are painted the same color of the building, that parking lot is included with the building. And uh, not, the, not that we can compare assessments to assessments, uh, but that whole property, the department valued at $520,000. So if you turn to the page, uh, you'll see Holden Street is uh, a lot of office space and uh, some storage space at the back, and you can see that that's obviously far superior to the subject property. Uh, if you look at page at number five, that actually has, uh, and all these have parking, where the subject property doesn't have any parking, and number five at 666 Ellis, I hope I pronounce this right, it's Nikian, whatever, it's college, it's actually been uh, renovated to be a college, so that's 
whole building inside has been renovated because it's a college. And the parking lot beside it is actually included with that property. So uh, that, I think, is a far superior building with a better location, and uh, it's got parking. Now we'll turn to my brief of question. Mr. Assessor. So you've taken some front pictures of these properties. Um, do you have any uh, aerial pictures of them to show the actual area it's in, or the location, or the land to building ratios for them? Uh, no, I didn't think that was uh, that was significant okay. to do something like that. It's to show the actual so quality of the building itself, and to show that there is some parking around. That. Have you have you inspected any of the buildings? No, I have not. So you don't actually know what the quality of these buildings are in the interior. Well, I've been in I've been in the Flame and Comfort yes a couple of times, so I know that's that's a nice space inside. Uh, being a college in the bottom of six 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 Ellis, I manage I would think that that's inside is a finished space because it's a college. Um, so looking at your comparable number three, there is a parking lot, but do you see any access to that parking lot from the main road? I uh, don't believe so. It's all no. from the back lane. Yes, it's all from the back lane as well. So it is difficult to access this building for trucks, is it not? Uh, I'm not sure from the back of the building. Depending on what they're doing and the, what, the, what they actually need uh, trucks for, they can have smaller trucks to unload. I don't, I don't believe that they're going to have semis going in there. Yeah. And um, for, your, I don't know for, sure. for your fourth comparable to holding property, the only, the only access again to that building is um, back lane access to the uh, the property or from the uh, from it looks, the it looks from the side that's the side of the property that would be the back lane correct uh, no that's in between two properties okay uh, yeah those are all my questions Mr. Sure. Whitford two questions you know it okay if you can uh, start with the front first page as you can see, the property hasn't been used for a while with all the weeds in front of it. They no longer run a business out of there. It's actually uh, the owner and the owner's son actually go drag racing. And they actually store their cars in there and work on them. It's for personal use. <coughs> and as you can see, that the, uh, the commercial building somewhere in the bottom, but the main floor is 7265 square feet. And then it's got the 1,088 square feet for a basement. Uh, any building that you have to walk into the middle of the building to walk down a set of stairs in the basement is unleasable. If you rent a building and it has a basement, the main floor rent basically covers the whole building. The only way you can rent out a basement is if there's a separate entrance to go down. But most one-story buildings that have a basement, the rent is on the main floor and they don't put a rate on the basement. And you'll see at the bottom, this property in uh, two years went up 50%. Uh, so the department's computer uh, said that this building should go up 50% in two years, which I think is not appropriate. So if you turn to page two, you'll see a picture of the basement, and that's uh, it's quite a grungy space down there. That's where they have the heating system. And you can see on the left there's some cold made two by four shelves, and those are all core parts piled on there. The building is, uh, as you can see, that uh, it's 1948. The effective year is 1948. It's basically a 1948 building. There's been no renovations put in this building whatsoever. So we turn to page three. See the uh, front of the owner's uh, son's truck there. And you see some light coming in. Uh, down the lane, there's a catch basin. And the owner's been complaining to the city for years that when it rains, the catch basin fills up. And basically, water comes into the bottom underneath that door. Excuse so that's me. Why Sorry, we're missing page two. Yeah, we are. Yeah, no page. No page two. No. No page two. We right. go from one to three. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, here, I'll pass it around. It's just a picture of the basement. Somehow the printer goofed up. And did. So on page three, uh, you'll see I have some comparables for 911 Higgins, uh, which assesses our comment 244 246 Jarvis or 272 
And the bottom there's some assessors comparables from uh, previous briefs to about 675 Washington, which is a better location at 375. And you've got 975 Main Street at 365. That's actually a two-story building uh, retail on the main floor. Uh, that's a eating store. Uh, so basically, I'm using $3.50 per square foot for the property to uh, 6% vacancy, 2% 375 shortfall, and 9.2%, which the department is using to come up with a total value of 236839 You turn to page 4, uh, there's a good comparable there that's on Main Street, sold in June of 2016, 981 Main Street. Uh, that would uh, be very comparable inside and outside. It's all original to the subject property. I've been in that building many times uh, since I do ride a motorcycle. I was in there last time. They were at a blowout sale to get everything out of there. Uh, that sold for 21 can a square foot. <coughs> so the subject property at that value, uh, it's a better location on Main Street, would be 153291 uh, I'm going to go with the income at 350 and ask that the board reduce it to 237 Again, remember that it was a 50% increase. I don't think a property like this, uh, it's not an investment quality building. Uh, I think that the cap rates uh, basically show that. And having a 50% increase in a building like this, I think, is uh, computers on the line. So I'm asking uh, for $3.50 for the rent. For two hundred thirty-seven thousand. That's my presentation. Mr. Sussman, uh, just a, two quick questions. So you brought in a comparable sale for an income-producing property. Okay. You brought in a comparable sale, even though we're doing this on the income. Program. Well, sales approach. There's three approaches to value. There's cost, income, and sales. Okay. Um, in terms of your rent comparables, uh, which would you say are your best rent comparables? I'd say the uh, best ones, well, they're not all, they're all better than subject property. I just brought those in to basically show that uh, the 350 I'm using is appropriate. They're all better buildings. Okay. Um, so if you're using the, if you're using a comparison approach, are you, are you aware that your Jarvis comparable and your Washington comparable both had sales? Jarvis was $450,000 in 2011 and Washington is one185 in 2013. Why did you not use those for comparable sales? Well, you're here to ask me questions about my evidence. That's that, a, I didn't bring that's in, in your the, evidence. But I didn't bring in the sales. Oh, I see. But, okay. Well, those are my questions. Mr. Uh, Whitbread. No questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any questions for you, but then I will revert back over. Sure. Could you give me those figures again for those sales? Uh, yeah. The Jarvis sale was 450000 and the Washington sale was $1.185 million. And what year? 2011 for Jarvis and 2013 for Washington. Okay. So questions, thank you very much. Let us take a five minute break. With 1300 St. James Street. So uh, roll number 0700154500, 1300 St. James. Uh, the roll year is 2020, the reference date is April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is 3152000 uh, There's an effective year built of 1973. Wall height of 29 feet. Uh, the construction class is masonry. The land area is 53,491 uh, square feet. The uh, leasable and gross floor area is 43,189 square feet for a land to plan of 1.24. Uh, if you turn to page two, uh, you can see there is some sales of this property. There's a recent sale on August 8th, 2017. Um, the department has not put a lot of weight on the sale as this is a transfer of power sale we found. Uh, this was an estate sale. The business went bankrupt and went into receivership and this is how the sale took place. Do you offer that information somewhere? I actually uh, do not have that information, but it is in the, uh, in the brief supplied by um, the appellant. Okay, but your brief is blank. Uh, my brief just has the sale there, yes. Yeah, so it's 
sorry. It has the sale? It has this, just the sale history of, on page two. Nope. I don't either. Okay. It's blank. blank. That's blank? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. It should be there. <laughs> and do you have numbers? You can just yeah, it? sure. The, uh, on, it's on August 8th, 2017. The sale is uh, $1,750,000. Yeah. And you made a comment, it's what kind of a sale? This would be a, a like an estate sale or a transfer of power sale. Transfer of powers, uh, which is and the business went bankrupt and went into receivership. So, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, not a problem. I, I'm surprised it was not on there. So. <clears throat> um, so I guess we'll look at the, uh, the map quickly on page 8 to get an idea of the location. It's on St. James Street across from the Costco. Between Century and uh, Saskatchewan, is, uh, it runs uh, perpendicular to it. Uh, page eight, you can get an idea of uh, the front view or the Google Street view. You can see the uh, the loading dock. I believe that is the only uh, that is the only loading dock or loading area. There's more than there's two or three docks, but only loading area uh, to back in trucks. As you can see, due to the land load to building ratio, there's not a lot of maneuverability for to get trucks in and out. Um, and then page 10, you just get a view from behind it and uh, the side of it and the front of it as well. So now we have an idea of what it looks like. We'll go to our, the rank comparables on page 3. Uh, these net rents range from uh, $5.50 all the way up to $6.80 a square foot. Um, the effective years range from 19 60 all the way up to 1975 and the average wall heights range from 13 feet up to 20 feet and the least areas range from uh, 30,400 square feet all the way up to 53,709 square feet. Um, they're all the comparables are quite close to the property. They're on Dublin, Notre Dame, there's also one in St. James, uh, King Edward and 1895 Century is directly behind the building. <coughs> So turning to page four, we can see the income workup. We're using a model rent of five dollars and fifty-nine cents per square foot, applied to the leaseable area of forty-three thousand one hundred and eighty-nine square feet for a potential rent of two hundred and forty-one thousand four hundred and twenty-seven dollars. We're applying a four percent vacancy, two percent expenses, and we're applying the seven percent capitalization rate to the net operating income of two hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and fifty-seven dollars for an estimated value of $3,152,000. Um, <coughs> moving on, uh, you can see the uh, capitalization rate table. Um, this falls between our 20th and 80th percentile in the table for the industrial properties. Uh, <coughs> age 11 has the capitalization rate evidence and page 12 has the non-recoverable expense evidence. So we feel that this property should be confirmed at 3,152,000. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I just have a couple. Um, could you take to your picture on page nine? Sure. Now, uh, there's an outline on there, color-wise, I don't know what color is, whether it's orange or yellow. Mm -hmm. It shows that's basically the property line around the building, correct? Correct. So it looks like there's about parking for about eight cars. Uh, that could be correct, yeah. And there's just, uh, as you stated, there's not much room to actually back in a semi-trailer in there. Um, yeah, but we can see in the picture semi-trailers are in there, so it is possible, but I, I would agree that, yes, there, there would be not a lot of room to do that. Okay, those are all my questions. Mr. Winfred. I wonder if you could, uh, I'm sorry, did you visit the building? I have not been there. You haven't been there. Can you tell what the predominant factors are to bring that 7% cap rate into sort of the middle of your 20th day? Sure, yeah, um, definitely uh, the area would play a factor in that. St. James is a, is a good area to have an investment property per se. Um, also age would play a role in it, 1973 build. Um, 29 foot wall height would play a role in it. So, and then the area, the least school area, or the gross floor area, 53,000. So, those will all be factors that go into the 7% capitalization rate. A reduction in those areas, uh, an increase in the age, uh, lowering of the walls. 
that would decrease your cap rate in the model, yeah, perhaps based on those factors. Yeah. Okay. Degree, of course. Thanks. I understand that. Thank you. No further questions. Can you tell us a little bit more about your rent comps? Um, what is this particular property at St. James used for? Is it comparable use in, in this? Um, I believe it's a furniture company, JS Furniture is using it. Um, and they're using it just as a warehouse, yes, warehousing it's there? My, my, that's what I believe it's being used for, yes. Um, so in terms of the, the rent comparables, mm -hmm. um, I guess, Right behind it, at 895 Century, like literally directly behind it. If you if you look on the, uh, uh, you can see if you look on page 10, you can see 895. Uh, it's literally directly behind it. That's a flooring company. Um, and it's used as a retail space. Or there, there's there is some retail in it for sure. And there'd be some storage in there as well for their products. <coughs> um, sorry, I have some of my other examples here. Um, 1720 Dublin is a parcel service. Um, I don't know what all these other ones. Uh, 1495 St. James is an um, industrial uh, technologies place. And um, 230 Notre Dame, I'm, I'm not too sure what, what they do in there. So, okay. yeah. Wait, which one then was the JS Furniture? That would be that the subject. Is the subject. Oh, subject. oh, sorry. No. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, I have no questions. Rebuttal. So the property is actually all storage. Uh, there's nothing else in there. There's no office space or anything. It's just storage. They store the furniture in there, washers and dryers. Uh, basically products that they sell at their store. Who is the they? Is no, it's, it's, it's a furniture, JD something furniture, I forget the actual name of the company. They use a, dist a distribution kind of thing. He buys a lot of furniture from China and that, and then uh, he sells to smaller places and brand in Portland and things like that. Plus he has a furniture store himself. <clears throat> so, uh, going through the comparables, as you'll see, uh, comparable number one is actually uh, the UPS customer center, and it has drive-through loading, like you can actually drive uh, semi-trailers right inside to uh, unload them and load them up. Uh, it's got an extreme amount of parking on, the, uh, on both sides of the building. It has, uh, as you see, it's got a large area there that's all office space. And the side uh, pictures the, uh, where uh, semis can come out and go into the building. So it's uh, far superior to the subject. It's got a lot of parking area around it, plus it has a large office space. 2030 Notre Dame has a two-story office in the front of it, which the subject probably has no office space. And there's plenty of, uh, of parking and areas to operate semi-trailers. Trailers. So if you turn the page, that's actually the side view, so you can see how large that office area is, two-story office area, and you can see how huge that parking lot is around there for uh, trucks to maneuver to park, which the subject property uh, lacks. Uh, 1495 St. James, as you can see, that's uh, got parking out front. It's like a strip center where there's multiple tenants, and I believe it's the allied uh, uh, technologies in the front. And that's a far superior building and location on St. James than such property. Uh, and then you get 1500 King Edward, uh, which basically has office space again in the front. Uh, ceilings are not as high as the subject property. So if you turn the page, you'll see there's just some uh, drive-in grade loading at the back, but it's not a storage warehouse. And the last one, number 5, 895 Century, as you see from the uh, front picture, the side picture, that whole area in the front is actually uh, uh, the Metal Workers Union. So that's all office space, subject has no office, and the rest of the building is Bill Knight flooring. And I'd say probably half, I was in that building just recently, uh, since we need some flooring at home, and I would say that showroom space is probably half the size of that building. It's a huge showroom in there for Bill Knight. So again, it's got a uh, grade level that you can drive in. Uh,
obviously those semi trailers are going to are going to uh, load off there since the parking lot's right there with all the fencing. But it's got ample cuts to the parking, and it, I believe it's not comparable to the subject. Questions? Um, so you say there's no retail space in your property? No, it's all warehouse. The parking's not important. Well, parking is important. I mean, uh, the owner complains that basically since there's, he's actually had to, when he bought this building, he bought it because it was in his price range. And basically what he's had to do is he actually bought a, an older semi that's really, really short. There's no place to sleep in or whatever. It's a very short little semi. So uh, he's got a guy that runs trucks back and forth because there's only three loading docks. And they're taking stuff out of every truck. They just don't unload one truck, depending what orders they're putting through. So he has a hard time uh, to leave a trailer and a tractor there. So we just drop them off and move them and bring them back and drop them off and move them. So that's what he's doing. So that's one of the problems with the property. The big problem with the property is that there's no space. There's very little parking area. There's, I mean, you can only park about eight cars there. And there's no uh, place to actually maneuver semis. Like if someone, if the property next door, if the guy's got a bunch of cars out there, if he wanted to, he could make it impossible to park a semi there for some reason if he got mad at the owner. I mean, there's, there is no, as you can see from the picture, the assessor had, there is no land area. And that's one of the problems when I went to sell. It's all going to be business. Those are all my questions. Mr. Whitbread. Uh, I'll wait until. Uh, the applicant has made his yeah. briefing. Just a question about the, the parking. Uh, is it not true that warehousing tends to not require an awful lot of parking because there aren't very many employees, generally speaking, at a warehouse? Well, a warehouse basically needs uh, space to park the semi-trailers. <coughs> because otherwise you have to coordinate with whoever's pulling. Once the trailer's empty, it's not like you can just pull one out and put it in the lot somewhere or leave it in the lot and bring it back in. You've got to take it right off the property and put it somewhere and bring another one in. So it's not so much then employee and customer parking that's the issue, it's rather maneuvering space that's the issue. To park semis, right. Okay. And actually, uh, it's a problem just to have, if you look at all of the session comparables, you see there's numerous loading docks. Like some of these buildings have eight, ten loading docks. So you just park the semis there because they're being transported from somewhere else some other companies bring them in and they go off them. We're here, and then you load them at your leisure, whenever you've got time to load them. Here, you only have three loading docks. So once they're parked there, those guys got to get at them and get them empty. So they're just taking the stuff off, piling it all over the floor or whatever, just to get that truck out for the next one to come in. And if there's only three, you've got unloading and loading, because he distributes his product, and the product to other smaller companies. So that becomes a problem, you know, like empty set of a trailer. Now someone's got to move and get that trailer out of there because someone else owns that trailer. Then you bring in the trailer for shipping. So that becomes a real problem for property. Okay, thank you. All right, your evidence. Well, as the assessor has stated, the company that was in there actually went bankrupt, and they actually tried to lease that property for a number of years, and they couldn't. And the big problem is, is those loading docks, is that there's not enough loading docks to make that property viable. And you see, uh, that property's been for sale uh, before 2014, but that was the earliest advertising I could find, 2014. And again, right there, it says price reduced. And that was uh, Roswell uh, uh, Realty had that property. So they couldn't sell it. I believe it was actually for sale uh, before 2014, but 2014 they were trying to, that was the last, uh, the latest I could find that they were actually trying to sell that product. So if you turn the page, you see uh, it was offered for sale for $2.495 million, and that was actually the owner was selling it for that amount before it was foreclosed on. And he was trying to rent it, and he couldn't rent it. He was asking $8 gross for the property, he couldn't get it. So you can see it's basically a clear span warehouse. There's one small little office on the second floor. So you can see the four pictures of the inside. It's just clear span. It's a storage. It's 100% storage warehouse. So we turn the page to page three. We'll see uh, the 
I can't remember the company was trying to advertise it to sell now. Should have that in here. But what they tried to do is, after not being able to sell for a while, they decided to come up with, there's a lot more pictures like an artist's rendering of what you could do with the property. Like make it part warehouse, part retail. But in order to make the artist's renditioning drawing, because St. James would be a good place to maybe have a box store, because there's a lot of other stores, but it would be required to basically de demolish 16,000 square feet of that building to actually come up with some customer parking. So you can see the sketch underneath, that whole section of the building where the customer parking would all have to be demolished. So you'd have to take that into account, the fact that not only is he asking 2.9 million for the property, he's you gotta demolish 16,000 square feet of it and then renovate it so it's unviable. You might as well just buy another property or build one. It's, it just wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna fly and it never did. So the owner tried that for about a year and a half and eventually the banks took over. And nobody wanted to buy it. So before the owner purchased it, there's some estimates of the work that's required to the, for the building. And basically the roof is shot, uh, it has to be replaced. The, uh, there was, I forget how many heaters, there was about 10 gas heaters in there. Five of them were tagged non-usable. They had red tags on them, they were non-usable, so you had to replace five heaters. So if you turn to page four, you'll see these are the, some of the uh, estimates for basically repairing that roof. And uh, there's some immediate repairs that had to be done uh, between five and $8,000. But to do the whole roof, uh, Norman Roofing had basically an estimate of $590,000 to replace that roof. So we turn to page five, uh, red sill roofing. Uh, figured out that there was a number of different ways that you could uh, repair it with different qualities of membrane. So basically they came up with a price from anywhere of $342,916 to $349,000 and $380,000 depending on the type of membrane you're going to put on there. So that, had to be, that has to be done. So we turn to page six. Again, there's some quotes of pricing uh, from Red Fuel. So in, in one particular quote, uh, the first one, number one, it's 734,213. Uh, quote number two with a distant exit with a different. Sorry, where, where are you? Page six. Page six, go ahead. Yeah. So you've got anywhere on this quote for different types of uh, insulation and uh, removing existing roof and uh, basically putting a new roof on. Uh, one quote was 734. 734,000. There's another quote for, for 607, uh, 647,000. Uh, there's another quote, depending on what you're going to do, at 445,000. And then just for a quick replacement, uh, spray foam was 316,000. So the cost of the roof are going to be quite high. If you turn to page seven, that is an appraisal. Uh, by Jerry LaChance, who actually used to work in the department. And he looked at it, inspected it, and came up with a value of $1,749,000. And that appraisal was out as of July 5th, 2017. If you turn to page eight, you'll see the counter offer to purchase. Uh, it was that they came down from the original price down to 1.9 million, and there's a count offer of 1.750, so 1,750,000. We turn to page nine. That's the income and expense questionnaire. Uh, again, it's obviously uh, 1,750,000. If you go down to the bottom of property characteristics, uh, the owner basically, uh, it would be hard for you to see, but it, he basically said that it was very, the building was in fair condition. Uh, it asks on uh, question 16, what do you intend to repair? It says heaters, roof, and lighting uh, at 750000 and he stated as affordable. When he has money, he will, uh, has to do those three things. So the paint turned to page 10. Uh, the property was not purchased on the net operating income. 
page 11 basically uh, shows that uh, John Solergio was the uh, purchaser. There's a different Manitoba number, but he was actually the purchaser of the property. And he turned to page 12. Uh, I think the building in this area is, is functionally obsolete as far as uh, when it comes to sending trailers backing in, and we spoke about that because there's only two loading docks. I have two sales there, 255 Hutchings, October 16, 3932 a square foot, and 1550 Church, February 18th at 4252 a square foot. And the subject sale price is basically $40.52 a square foot. So you'll see Hutchings has got a large office area, uh, lots of parking to move semis around. You can park the semis at the back. If you turn to page 13, you'll see Church. Uh, church basically has 10 loading docks, as I was speaking. There's basically seven on one side and uh, I believe three on the other side, for a total of 10. And you can see there's an extreme amount of space there to maneuver a semi to park it and leave it. So those are both uh, better locations than the subject property. I mean, St. James is a pretty hard place to maneuver a semi when you have the traffic on St. James trying to back, back into the subject property. So I think both these, pro these uh, properties are superior to the subject property. So I think the uh, sale price at $1,750,000 is appropriate. That's what it sold for. Uh, nobody else wanted to buy it. It was for sale for years. And uh, uh, I'm asking the board to reduce it to $1,750,000. Uh, the sale date was? Uh, sale date was... August 8th, 2017. Questions? Yep. Um, on page one of your brief, uh, it says price reduced. Do you know what if they were asking and what they reduced it to? They're asking two something. No, I can't give you the exact numbers. No, I don't have that on now. Okay. So you don't actually have what? The actual, like you stayed here, you typed in offer for sale at 2.495, but you don't actually have the list. Uh, I, I actually do on page two, it was offer for sale at 2.495. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But you have that typed in, do you actually have the, the listing of it stating that? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> turning into your page seven, so you have an appraisal of this property. That you, you don't supply the, the work up for it. Um, no. Okay, so you wouldn't know if if the appraiser included the expenses for the roof or to repair the roof, the capital cost. Uh, this, you see, it says uh, this figure includes a cost to cure. Okay, so he probably would have included the capital cost of the roof in that. I believe so. Okay. So, and in appraisal theory. We don't usually include with the income approach. I'll have to correct that. I'm not sure. Okay. But you are aware that we usually don't include capital costs, like the cost of a roof is not included as a periodic expense or repair or maintenance. Or well, you can't amortize a uh, roof and all those types of things can be amortized over the lifespan of the roof. Yeah. So you, you would agree that this, this um, sale, this particular one where your client bought it, never hit the open market. This was a uh, oh, the sale really, was under order. No, no, this this thing was in the open market for years. I mean, you can see on. Uh, I mean, I have the ad right there at the bottom. Commercial real estate, spring 2014, price reduced. There's the there's the advertisement in 2014. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about the sale in 2017 on your page eight. Uh, the, at the top of your page eight, under counter offer, it says the Business Development Bank of Canada under order for a sale, hereby accept the attached offer to purchase. So they're under order. And then looking further down to, uh, to the, uh, the second paragraph, number two, it says the vendor is not a mortgagee in possession, but rather a mortgagee with power to, s to sale by virtue of order of sale. That's correct, because it fell back into the bank's hands. Mm -hmm. <coughs> We went bankrupt and it was foreclosed on. Right, so this would be like a sale technically <coughs> under duress then because they went into bankrupt. Right. That's correct. It was advertised for years and nobody made an offer of it. Uh, those are all my questions.
second, please. Mr. Whitfrank. Mm -hmm. So, following your brief and um, your rebuttal, then, your discussion about no office space, no office space, no office space seems to be a bit redundant based on your claim of functional obsolescence. Would you agree with that? Well, if you have office space, you're going to get, it will demand a higher rent because right. you do have higher, because uh, you do have <coughs> office space. The more office space you have, you're going to get a, a higher rent for a lot of office space because it gives you more flexibility in what you can do with the building. And so by my reckoning, 700 office uh, feet of, square feet of office space on page one of your brief, as in the advertisement, to me gives the space enough um, room for three to six people. Uh, in a building of this nature, that seems to be a lot of office space. So, so I, I'm just curious about your emphasis on no office space throughout your presentation. Well, 700 square feet is not a lot of office space in, in a building of this size. Like if you look at the assessor's comparables, like you look at number two, Notre Dame, there's two stories of office space. Mm -hmm. And there could be maybe, I mean, I'm going to guess, but there could be maybe six, 7,000 square feet of office space. Mm -hmm. Where this only has uh, 700 square feet, and up in that 700 square feet is there's a washroom, there's a lunchroom. So you've got to take that out uh, of mm -hmm. the equation. Mm -hmm. So it's just a small area for guys to change and things like that. It's, that's what they're using it for. So it's, it's very minimal. 700 square feet in the building, the size is very minimal. Where the other ones, I mean, if you're looking at uh, any of these other comparables, the assessor has like Notre Dame has two stories of office. You could actually rent all the office out to someone and use the warehouse for yourself. So you would say the office space is moot given given the uh, sale price of one million seven fifty. Correct. And the other thing is if you've got office and you're renting it to people, now you need parking. There's only eight stalls for people's cars. So if you had like you said, if you had six people up there working, well now you got two spots to park cars. Well there's four guys, five guys that work in the warehouse. Where are they going to park? Okay, that's it. Thank you. No more questions. Ms. Um, no, no thanks. No questions. I'm trying to figure out which approach you've used here. Uh, it's well, not the sales. approach. I'm using the sales. I'm relying um, on the sale. On the sale, as opposed to comparable sales? Well, the compar I'm using the comparable sales to support what the property so was purchased for. And using these two on page 12. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what you're doing. Well, what I'm saying is if, I mean, the question has to be asked, is that sale price relevant? Is it, it was a duress to the point where they gave it away? Well, I have two sales there that proves they didn't give it away. They got basically what it's worth, even taking into consideration of the roof. Because you've got, I mean, this, the sale price of the subject property is forty dollars and fifty-two cents a square foot. Okay. The Hutchings property sold for thirty-nine thirty-two. Sorry, just a minute. The the subject at one million seven hundred fifty thousand is forty dollars. Page twelve. Subject. Oh, there. Sorry. Yes. So if the okay. subject property for its inefficiencies mm -hmm. and for the problems it has. It sold for $40.52 a square foot. Well, Hutchings, as you can see, has got a lot of office space. It's got a lot of places to maneuver semis. It's a lot more usable than the subject property. Uh, not even to talk about where it is. I mean, it's in the Institute Park area, so semis drive around there all the time. Imagine pulling a semi out and blocking two lanes of St. James to try to back that thing in. You almost have to get someone out there with flags and say, oh, you're, you'll stop for backing the semi in. So that sold for $38.32. Now, if you turn to page the church avenue, well, there you've got lots of office space. You've got 10 loading docks, like the back of the property is huge. And that basically sold for $42.52 a square foot. So the actual sale price of the subject property is right in line. In fact, if I was talking to the owner, I said, yeah, I would have told him, you would have been better off buying any of those other two properties than the property you bought. I don't, I mean, he's not an investor. He doesn't buy property to invest. He just, Thought well, it's close to the store. I'll buy it. Now he's now he's talking to me, complaining. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay.
1300 St. James. Next is 92 Higgins, going back to the Higgins area. My favorite. Uh, <clears throat> the roll number is 1309113071001092 92 Higgins Avenue. <clears throat> uh, the roll year is 2020. The reference date is April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is $505,000. Um, as you can see at the bottom, there's a recommendation to confirm the assessment because there is a supplementary assessment has been issued due to the merge of the property between uh, this property and the next one, which is 47 Gomez. Um, I'll just speak to this quickly so we have an idea. Um, if you turn to page 8, you can get a, just a quick look at the property. It's mostly parking lot with a small building, I guess, to the... Um, uh, front of Higgins Avenue there to the right. And the building sort of jetting out on the left-hand side there would be considered uh, 47 Gomez. So we are merging that building and, or that roll number and this roll number together. Sorry, I'm not following. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna have sorry. to find a better picture here yeah. for you guys. So I think I have one. <clears throat> Okay, perfect. If you go to um, my brief for 47 Gomez, mm -hmm. this will give you a better picture okay. on page 8. Page 8, you said? Yes. Okay. So you get the overhead view at the top of the page, on page 8, the row there. Yeah. Okay, so this, the whole reddit area is now what's been merged together. If you look basically at the large building at the dotted area, that used to be one roll number. That, that would be 47 Gomez. Okay, and then so the just other, that little corner. And then the other, yeah, the whole building would be 47 Gomez. And mm -hmm. then basically the parking lot in that little corner with that building would be 92 Higgins. So the parking lot went with 92 Higgins? Um, 92 this, Higgins. This is yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a small building. That Right there. So this gives you an idea of how it's being merged together. So they were both separate roll numbers at one time. They're now going to be combined to be one. So a supplementary notice has or will be sent out, um, and there will be a, a new assessment on it. So which basically is going to be making these two assessments mute. point. So um, I'm simply asking for confirmation, knowing that there's another assessment coming out. Um, of course, it's the prerogative of the uh, appellant if he wants to continue with the... I've dealt with mergers before with properties, and this is relevant to hear the appeals because they're two separate properties. They both have a value to them on the income approach, and therefore, when the board decides that value is when they're merged, it's just the total of that value. Will they continue as two separate income streams? Correct. So, I mean, the department, at this time, anytime they merge, they pull a rabbit out of their hat and then they say, well, you know, it's worth more now that this property's combined. It's not. It's two separate buildings, two different people rent. One rents the warehouse of 47, the other rents the smaller uh, 92 Havens. So the value is decided on both those properties when you merge them. It's just a combination of those two values added up. There's no, no magic in this. Why are they being merged? It was actually asked for by the owner for it to be merged together. So. That's my understanding of it. We have the land title summary here and the, the original instrument and it was asked by the owner to have these properties merged. Is it a single title that covers um, the merged role? That's title? correct. That is, yeah. That would it's be for, you want to have it because the 92 has more parking on it. So for development, you want to put it all in one title so that you can go across those lines if you're doing any kind of future development. Otherwise, that line prohibits any kind of development. Like if, if someone was to bulldoze 92 Higgins and decide, well, we want to put a bigger building up there, if it, it may cross property lines or vice versa. So it's just to make the property one package. Um, and it was purchased so, so the as one package. Okay. So the request is to make it a single role entry, reflecting the fact that it is already a single title, or is it two titles as the owner is seeking to merge that into single It would title. be two titles being merged into one. It's currently two titles. Well, yes. There's actually, when the, when the owner bought 
this property. He bought 47 Gomez, which is the big warehouse. He bought 92 Higgins, this little tiny property. And he bought 34 McDonald, which touches the property. And there's 100 Higgins, which is a service garage on the property. So there's actually four buildings on the property. And out of those four buildings, there's three titles. So he's merging the big warehouse with this one to have more land, like to have a larger land area because this property has more land than the uh, big warehouse. So presumably, an entry in the assessment role is to be an entity that is marketable, mm -hmm. since we're doing this at market, uh, market value. Currently, it is two different titles. Correct. Those could be sold separately. Correct. Would they be sold separately? Might they be sold separately? Well, they, I guess they could at the moment be sold separately. Once they're merged together, they would have to be separated again to be sold separately. So, but what is coming first is the is the merging of the assessment role entries preceding the title change, or is it waiting upon the title change? It, title has to be done first. Title would have to be done first. Yeah. Okay. So. I believe that that, so we're already in the process of merging it, so I believe the title would have to have already been completed. But under the income approach, both properties would have a different income, income stream. stream. So nothing would really change. All right. This is a strange situation. Let's, let's carry on with, you, you're, you want to carry on with a separate deal. Let's carry on that way and we'll hear. Sure. Could I just ask you a question? In what way do you think it's strange? Uh, in that, something that has two titles, mm -hmm. they are uh, separately marketable Correct. because they are two different titles. Right. The obligation of the assessor, as I understand it, is to enter into the role a marketable entity, which could be more than one certificate of title, a certificate of title, and a very unusual circumstances, potentially less than a certificate of title. So I'm just sort of questioning the, the process here because oh, it, it would seem to me that yes it's appropriate, it's conceivable that the merging of the, the assessment of all entries would happen but only after the certificates of title Correct. Are, are changed. We're talking about the 2020 role here. The way that the role is, is currently still shows two titles. Uh, for the moment, yes, it will show two titles, but like I said, a supplementary role will come Whoa. out for 2020. Okay. All right. with well then, given that it's two titles, I got no problem with dealing with... Well, even if it was one title, it's still going to be two income streams, and the value of that property would be those two income streams, whether it's yes. two titles or one title, it should be the same value. All right. In that case, we will carry on. Okay. Um, so the roll number is 130911307. I think, sorry, I've already gone through this. <laughs> yeah, um, so okay, we'll carry on to, uh, we'll quickly go through the actual year built is uh, 1962. The wall heights are uh, 14 feet to 20 feet. The uh, land area is 69,739 square feet. The gross floor area is uh, <coughs> 7,080. And the leaseable area is 7,082 square feet for a land plan of 9.85. Um, so we've already taken a look at the overall property, so we have an idea of what it looks like. So I'll just turn to page three of my brief, and we'll go through some of the rent comparables. Um, they're on Logan, Clifton, Weston, Higgins, Wall, and Aaron. Um, the net rents range from <coughs> Seven dollars, sorry, six dollars and twenty-nine cents, up to fourteen dollars and fifty cents a square foot. Um, the effective years built range from 1948 all the way up to 1975, and the uh, wall heights range from 11 feet up to 22 feet, and the um, <coughs> lease areas range from 3,770 square feet all the way up to 7,170 square feet. Um, on page four, we're using a potential rent of $43,961. Uh, we are applying a 6% vacancy, a 2% expense, and a 7.7% overall capitalization rate for an estimated value of 
and uh, five thousand dollars. <coughs> Turning to page five, you can see that it falls within the 20th to the 80th percentile of our uh, capitalization rates. Um, page seven has some pictures of the property. You can see sort of the small uh, building to the side there on the open expanse, so lower down of the uh, parking lot. Of course, the map at the top. Just another overhead view on page eight of what it looks like with the large parking lot. Page 10 gives you another view. Page 11 has the uh, mailer, and they have the, um, the rents or the uh, the rent roll for uh, the property on page 12. And our capitalization rate evidence is shown on page 13, and the non-recoverable expense is shown on page 14. Uh, we feel the value at 505,000 is fair and equitable and should be confirmed. Thank you. Mr. Uh, yes, on page one, the, the actual year built is 1962, the effective year is 1962. That would indicate probably no money has been spent on the building, correct? Um, Not any kind of significant money has been spent on the building. Okay, well that's probably, yeah, there, there hasn't been, I guess, uh, any significant money in terms of structural repair or anything like that on the building. And I'm looking at your page three, your comparables. Uh, I'm quite familiar with rents around Higgins. Uh, your fourth comparable at 173 Higgins Avenue, $14.50. Did that not stand out to you to be kind of excessive for Higgins, $14.50? Oh, well, that's the rent that's being um, uh, basically shown in the mailer that we had. But again, it is only a one year rent, so it is possible that they uh, had to increase the rent for that one year. Did you actually examine the income expense mailer to see whether or not everything was there was a question? I haven't, or not? I haven't, not to my knowledge, I, I have not uh, examined that one. Okay, so you're not familiar. That, I guess that number just came what was input, uh, inputted into the computer? It was definitely inputted into the computer. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and do you realize uh, that there's actually ba basement space? If you look at page four, uh, there's two. Premise ID numbers is one of those for the basement. Oh, uh, as you see on page one, we, we don't have any basement square footage, so I have not inspected the building, so I'm not too sure if there is a basement or not. Okay. Uh, page eight and page nine. What year are those pictures from? Because the Canada cartridge has been out of there for uh, they left in 2016. This is the uh, page eight and page nine. This was taken in 2018. This is 2018. Yeah. Are you sure? That would be what our uh, PAD ID or our ATDU has. Yes. Okay. Now, if that was taken for 2018, uh, let's look at page eight. Now, the subject property is in the right-hand corner, correct? Correct. And you can see the lot is full of cars and semis, etc. Correct? Correct. Okay, now let's put, turn back to page seven. Mm -hmm. That lot is empty. Yes, it is. There's no semi-trailers. Uh, there's nothing there. There's no cars. There's no nothing. So would that not give you any indication that perhaps your pet eye view is not right? Well, um, no. Like 2018 is a long time. They can move cars in and out. They're not stationary objects. So, and, and I guess, and this is interesting because. This is a, uh, a Google Street Map view, and I have no idea when this was taken. It could have been 2017, too, so, or 2018. So I know from, from what we have, this is 2018. Okay. That would be, I have to make a statement, that is, your iPad ID is incorrect, because Canada Cartridge, they vacated in 2016. There's nothing there in the pad, and if you look at the uh, page 7, when you go, go on Google, Google Maps, Maps and you type in an address, what comes up is the last Google Maps. So this would have been 2018. But I'll get to that in my rebuttal. That's all my questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Whitford. Uh, is it safe to say you didn't attend the premise? No, I haven't. You haven't attended? Do you know what work goes on in there? Um, inside the building. It's actually a small building itself. Um, Mailer states uh, it's uh, 
10 more enterprises, so I'm not too sure. You're not sure? Do. No. And without, or sorry, uh, looking at your page 8, I'm counting 70 vehicles, more than 70 vehicles, not including the trailers and the other larger vehicles. Mm -hmm. 70 vehicles that would attend to that place of work. Um, just following the line, uh, you have no idea why there are so many vehicles parked there, or whether they're generating revenue, whether it's a used car lot. You don't have any of that information? No, well, that which should be supplied on the mailer. If I can't find any, anything there. On page 11, yeah, so they haven't indicated if there is any revenue being generated. No parking revenue. Um, well, they have no parking revenue. No other revenue based no. on used car sales. Uh, uh, not on the mailer, no, they're not indicating that. So. But it does seem kind of strange to your eye as well. Um, I, I don't know, like, um, again, this is, this is owned by one person, this, or these two properties which are merging together are owned by uh, one entity basically on different titles, so I don't know if the, uh, the building of Gomez is also using this parking lot, if there's transfer between Ah, oh. there we go. Oh, I have the answer for you. I'm looking at these trailers. And I'm looking at, it, turn to page eight, nine. I remember what the owner told me. Look at page nine. Now you see all those trailers that talk of vents on them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, everyone has a vent on them. Yeah. And then you see there's like a trailer with a door open. It's and, like uh, a horse trailer. It almost looks like that. But you know what was happening? Is for a small period of time, the owner was renting the warehouse to a movie company. Oh. Ah. That's, I mean, when I saw this picture, I couldn't figure out what the heck is going on. And now it just dawned on me because he told me it. I asked him about something. He said, well, I, I, I kind of rented the space off and on uh, for a couple months at a time to a movie company. That's why all these trailers have vents on the top because they could have been for feeding people. They could have been where people dress and that. That's There's no way that a tractor can move in and pull no, away. No, that's why there's cars. so many cars. It's all the guys. And then when I looked at it, because actually a friend of mine I used to race with, he actually had a business. He was the, the drummer from Harlequin. And the, it, it, in the picture, I don't know if you can see it, but I know what this is. This little tiny trailer, this little tiny thing is a generator. And they basically have to have generators that you see them running on the street, and they have to be so well insulated that you can't hear them. And I'm just looking at that, and that's probably what all the little things are. Mm. So that was from a movie shoot. Okay. So that, that, leads me, that leads me to another question. That, that makes sense. sense. Um, I think a couple of days in the past week I've heard argument from the city about a ratio of four to one and surplus land. Um, I'm not hearing that argument here that this, and it is quite subdividable in my humble opinion. Yeah, I was, I'm uh, not hearing that discussion. I'm actually surprised about that myself and um, that it, there is no excess land put on this one. Um, I didn't investigate that too much further knowing that there was a merge happening between these properties. So um, <clears throat> you're, you're not incorrect. It, it is to a level it is subdividable, and there probably should have been excess land put on it. But again, the property is being merged, which is going to definitely reduce its um, its land to building ratio once it does. Well, we're not dealing with that today, I understand correct? That. But that's that's basically my reason why I can't answer your question exactly. So if I can just close that loop then. Assuming that would happen, there could potentially be a higher value assessed to this to this Potentially, property. yeah, there could definitely be excess land for this property. Yes. Thank you. I have no other questions. <laughs> well, the small building appears from the mailer to have only one occupant. So I'm not understanding why there are two different rents and two different premise IDs. Uh, well, at one time there there may have been two different um, occupants in there. Um, at the moment, uh, I guess there's only one, so it potentially could have had it broken up that way, and we just haven't changed it yet. And so the, this is being rented out. Mm -hmm. It's not owner occupied. That's correct. And that occupant has two different rents for two different areas of the building. That, well, no, that that's not correct. The uh, the occupant is only using, I believe it says in the mailer, 3,000 square feet of the 7,000 square feet. So it looks oh. like it can be can be separated that way. Sorry, the owner, uh, sorry, the occupant is using how many? It says in the mailer, it says 3,000 3, square feet. Thousand. So it's neither 4,900 nor 2,100. No, it's, it's not, but um, 
Let's take a look here for a second. The actual mailer says he's using 4896 square feet. Oh, sorry, 4896 square feet. I was looking at that. That's correct. So basically, yeah, he's using one portion, the 4900 that we have up there. And your blended rate then is? Okay, that's all my questions. Uh, I just, yeah, I, I'll go on uh, my rebuttal on this, but I just want to make a comment to the excess, excess land. Uh, what is not seen on the, uh, there is no excess land on this property. What you don't see on this property is we'll get on the, when we get to the 47 Goldman's, there's actually another building on here. There's actually a service garage that's not in this picture. You'll see it in 47 Gomez because it's a bigger picture. In fact, I'll even show you what uh, we'll talk about. Well, he doesn't have that picture yet. Well, what it is, there's the warehouse. If you're looking at the property, the warehouse is, let's say Higgins is here. There's a warehouse up here. There's the subject property you're talking right here. And over here, there's actually a large service garage for semi-trailers. So there's no way you could, there's no excess land. And if you looked at some of the comparables that I showed in the other brief, uh, the Sussex Comparables has huge areas. Or if you look at something like a Superstore, or, I mean, the ones I'm thinking of is like uh, the Superstore on uh, St. Anne's. It has huge parking, and there's no excess land on that. So properties like this do have an awful lot of land because you need that maneuverability to turn the truck around. But there's actually on the uh, there's actually three buildings on that parcel. You just don't see the other one. <coughs> well, in fact, you can see it. if you look yeah. at if you look at my brief at 92 Higgins. Your brief. Uh, my uh, 92 Higgins. You see the bottom picture. You can see there's some semi-trailer trucks there, and there's a building right on Higgins. That's 100 Higgins. <coughs> very bottom picture on the left. You can actually okay. see it better on the 47 Gomez brief on page 8. Yeah, so there's another building on there. I'm getting good stuff as to when I should be. And that was, that's a service garage from Canada Cartage was there. Yeah. So those buildings are part of what? The four They're all in the same lot. The 92 Higgins? Yeah, the 92 Higgins is on, on the street, like in the top middle picture, it's on the street at one end, and in the bottom picture, 100 Higgins is at the other end of that property, so there's another building on the other end. At 100? At 100 Higgins. But that's not in the... That's not in the red. Included in the red line that we're dealing with. <coughs> that's another building that's part of that property. But it's not part of the ones that are being... No, it's on a separate... It's so got it's, its own separate title, too. So though. it's yeah. kind of out of the picture, yeah, right? Yeah, we can't yeah. include that. Well, I'm not including it. I'm just saying as far as the property, that building has some land in front of it. Okay. Okay. But to have excess land, it has to be somehow divided, and you have to get access to it. So mm -hmm. your, your comment would suggest that this land... Which page are you on? I'm on sir? page 8 of your... Page 8. Gomez, yes. 47 yes. Gomez, top picture. You would suggest that service area prevents excess land from being available on uh, 92 Higgins? Yes, because you, you basically have to, if you have excess land, you have to have access to it somehow. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at page 8, there are houses down one side, mm -hmm. and you can see the length of those trailers. Mm -hmm. Well, if you had a, uh, you know, that trailer needs that space where all those cars are, to back out past the trailer that's parked beside to turn around and go out. Mm -hmm. So those trailers are 53 feet long with excess space in front. We're talking 60 to 70 feet, two and a half times. That space is probably 150 to 200 feet wide. Lots of room for an a long access road in. Um, 
I'm, I'm challenging your comments on the basis of accessibility. I, I think I could easily build well, an access could, road and uh, put, a, put another building on that uh, okay, property. Well, on page 8, you can see the trailer mm -hmm. is about half the distance from the property line. The end of the trailer is about half the distance from the property line. Well, it's one and a half trailers, kind of. Depends right under trailer. the 318, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, that 318, but still, if you, took, if you took a strip out, let's say if you took a strip, half that strip out, mm -hmm. how would that trailer turn around? We don't know what the use of the building is going to be. No, but if you put another building on that strip, yeah. then that trailer couldn't turn around. It's got to back out. You've got to back that trailer out probably to the, to the property line to turn the front to, to get it out. I think, I think we're speculating about the uh, use of the property without any knowledge here and really what we need to focus on is the city's assessment at the 4.1 ratio and the land being excess and if it is in excess it creates additional value. So my but point is taken and it's agreed upon by the city. Not that this land is. There is no suggestion that you are. I, 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 I have not suggested that we are putting an excess land right. onto this. Right. I, I have just said I haven't investigated it further because I know a merge is happening. I got that. I guess the only comment I could make is since the property is there, the city's never made any excess land argument on that property. Yeah. Oh, okay, we're bottle done. time? Yes. Fresh <laughs> eyes, hey? Eh? Now, obviously, for my brief, you can see the uh, pictures of the subject property. And I'd like you to turn, to, first of all, to page two of, your brief? of my brief. And you'll see in the middle there, it says Commercial Building Summary. On page two of my brief. No. Nope. <clears throat> Anything else? I can't find that. Right here. Right here. Commercial Building Summary. So, yep. So this is the city measuring this building up when it was first built. And you'll see basement area is 2160. The main floor area is 4,922 square feet. Mm -hmm. That's the city's numbers. And you'll see income and expense questionnaire online that they fill out. The total leasable is 8496, which is the owner's using. So the main floor is 4922 from the city. That's what they've determined. So the computer, or whoever put anything into the computer for the valuation on the assessor's brief is incorrect. So going to my rebuttal, these are pictures of the assessor's comparables. Again, we've got 318 Logan, which is Flame and Comfort, which is actually retail. The subject, pro the subject property is actually used by a moving company. And they store their mats for uh, covering furniture and stuff when they move. They have dollies in there. They've got boxes in there uh, for uh, people that are moving to use. That's what the subject property is used for. So number one, in the assessor's comparables, 318 Logan is actually a flame and comfort. As I said, it's retail. Number two is actually a garage. So that's not comparable. Uh, at one time, uh, before the ground store systems was in there, was actually uh, called uh, Rick's Auto Body. So you can see seven overhead doors. That's not comparable. Number 301 Western is a two-story multiplex warehouse with multiple tenants. 15 tenants. So they have a showroom on the main floor. Uh, they'd have some office space upstairs. And in the back of the building would be uh, the, the flex warehouse. Better location. Uh, I'd say that property is not comparable. Number four, let me turn the page, is 173 Higgins. Uh, I really doubt that 1450, I can't see if we can get that kind of rent in Higgins, but this is a call with applied technologies. And that building from the outside, you can see the windows and uh, the exterior of the building has all been uh, repaired, uh, renovated. And since it is a college, I would imagine most of the space inside on that part of the building is the classrooms. The end of the building there uh, obviously is some shop space where whatever they're doing in there when it comes to applied technologies, uh, they must be doing in the back. 
Number five, comparable. 595 wall is not comparable. As you can see, it's a pretty fancy building. And actually, it's called the Barn and Hammer Brewing Company. So it's a microbrewery. And if you turn the page to the next page, you'll see that's the inside of that building. Far superior to the subject property. And the last one on the six, it's 1561 Aaron. Uh, it appears to be some kind of a shop of some kind, but you can see it's got the warehouse style uh, height, some offices in the front, and in the back of the building is quite high with a uh, drive in for uh, trucks. Yeah. It's some kind of shop. I couldn't, uh, from the internet, I couldn't determine who's actually the tenant in that. But that's my regard. Question. <clears throat> so all these comparables I'm showing here, you would agree, are similar age to the, actually older than the uh, subject property? Uh, similar in age, but uh, most of them are older. Far superior in the quality of the space, like 301 Weston. Um, That's built in 1975. So it was one that's built around the time of the subject property. Um, Which one are you referring to? Have you, just the one that you referred to, the 1975. So have you inspected any of these properties? Oh, uh, just the plain comfort of the name. Okay, uh, so those are all my questions. Mr. Whitbread. No questions, thanks. Ms. Nesbitt. Yep. Uh, this last uh, one that appears to be a shop, the blue one, uh, you don't know what's going on in there. You, care to speculate based on the top picture with the massive air outlets on the side wall there? Uh, well, I, I don't know who was in there now, but I know Koch, uh, Koch Steelworks was in there. And Koch basically, I bought products off them, like uh, railings and stuff. They do a lot of, uh, in bars, like the railings and bars, anything out of brass, because I bought some brass railings for one hour six years ago, but I did find that Koch was in there some time ago, but it was an old ad kind of thing. But so I'm thinking it's some kind of a manufacturing or something. Because Scotch Steel, uh, I bought, they're in the North End now, and that's where I bought my products from them. And they, they deal a lot with uh, polishing products, like you need something polished to restore to you. They deal with a lot of stainless steel bending and manufacturing. Uh, they deal with brass a lot. Uh, if you had a you know, real fancy building, you want brass rails or that kind of stuff, or big sheets of brass that you made into something, that's what they do. But they were a tenant there, so I would say it's more like a manufacturing space. Okay. Your evidence then? Uh, as you see from the, we've looked at the pictures already, so you can see what the actual subject property looks like. You print, turn to page two, you'll see that the actual uh, computer, the city has raised the value from 268 to 505 so that in, on Higgins Avenue in two years it's gone up 88 percent which is highly unlikely and then I already went through that there's a basement area of 2160 which would have been included in the main floor rent I've been in there it's not the greatest basement space so the main floor area is basically 4922 and uh, this the uh, owner rents it out at 4896 square feet so turn to page three Again, you'll see it's 4,896 square feet. It's been that way for years. Uh, they're paying $3,000 a month uh, gross rent. That's been the same rent since 2016. And I actually checked into it, and the uh, company that was in there before 2016 almost paid the exact rent. So the rent in that property is pretty well hit uh, the top of what it can uh, achieve. Uh, you turn the page four. Uh, you see it's a gross rent, and actually what only $23,000 worth of maintenance uh, repairs. Uh, they lost $30,000 in 2016. And that's a $7.35 uh, per square foot gross. Uh, that's at the bottom. You turn to page five. Uh, you'll see a bunch of comparables uh, that basically just support the rent I'm using at $5. And for being on Higgins Avenue, $5 net is actually pretty good for that building. I would say it's acceptable. I'm using the city's parameters. at 6%, 2%, 375% for shortfall, and 7.7% uh, capitalization rate. 
And the only thing that's actually changed over the last few years, uh, the rent has stayed the change, has stayed uh, the same, but the department, uh, for some reason, however they do their cap rates, I believe recognize the stagnation of the cap rates. Because in 2018, the cap rate was actually 7.5%, and now it's at 7.7%. So the only value difference, I believe, is basically from the cap rate. Shortfall went up uh, 10 cents, it used to be 365, or 360, it's now 375. So seeing that the cap rate moves slightly, uh, the location of the property, and what it's used for uh, on the Higgins, uh, the condition and location, I believe that the uh, 260,000 is uh, fair and equal to that property. Uh, since you're looking at 2018, the board revision reduced it to 268 from my first my front page. So basically, the property has stayed the same as far as valuation goes. And that's my presentation. Question. Just a quick question here. Um, so you you have on your page four you have the 2016 mailer. You, you stated that there is a, a negative net operating income mostly due to uh, maintenance of repair of 23,000? Correct. Um, so would those have been renovations that they've done to the place? Uh, that was maintenance on the building. Okay. Because uh, you'll see, if you look at 2017, they, maintenance and repair was only $634. Well, that's, that's kind of what I'm wondering here, is because it seems like a very large gap between maintenance and repair between each year, so it just seems more like it would be renovations or capital costs that they're adding to the structure? It would be capital cost repairs. But I'm not using that 2016, I'm using the 2017. Okay, so um, those are all my questions. Mr. Whitbread, no questions. Thank you. Nope. United. We're getting shorter and shorter, aren't we? Yes. You mind if you take a quick five minutes? Certainly. With 47 Gomez, surprise, surprise. <clears throat> Roll number 13091260100, uh, 47 Gomez Street. Uh, the roll year is 2020, the reference date is April 1st, 2018, and the assessed value is uh, $4,080,000. <clears throat> uh, the uh, the actual year builds from 1950 to 1960, the effective year is 1961 to 1962. The wall heights are 14 feet to 20 feet. The construction class is masonry. <coughs> the land area is 73,298 square feet. Leaseable area is 64,700 for a land plan of 1.32. I believe that we're all somewhat familiar with the property now, so we probably don't need to go through the uh, pictures in great detail. So we'll turn to uh, page two and see that they uh, there is no uh, they are compliant for the list of that for some reason. But anyways on to page three um, and the uh, the rent comparables they uh, they range from five dollars and fifty cents a square foot up to eight dollars and twenty five cents a square foot. The effective years are um, 1960, 61 and 1963 the wall heights range from uh, 21 to, or 20 feet to 22 feet, and the least areas range from uh, 45,288 square feet all the way up to 53,709 square feet. Um, <clears throat> the comparables had to go a little bit outside the area due to the size of the property, so they're on Madison, uh, Dublin, Barrie, and Notre Dame. Uh, so we look at the. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We look at page four and our income worker. So we have a potential rent of $383,373, which would give us, give me a second here, calculate the rate. Uh, hold on a second, that's definitely not correct. So we'll continue on then. Um, the vacancy is <laughs> thanks. Yeah, five point uh, 
So we're using a vacancy of 6%, expenses of 2%, and overall capitalization rate of 8.3% for a estimated value of applying that to our net operating income of $338,606 for an estimated value of $4,080,000. Um, you can see our capitalization rate falls um, within the, uh, the city of Winnipeg parameters um, between the 5.5 and the 9.8, it's on the higher end. Three. Um, so page seven again, just get a look at the, uh, the area, you can look at the, uh, the building that faces Gomez um, on the, uh, the bottom page on the Google Street View, page seven, just some aerial photos that we've already looked at on uh, page eight and nine. Uh, page 10 does have a mailer, which is um, showing are some tenants in the building on page 11 and for the rent roll. Uh, they are on month to month leases they are stating here. Uh, page 12 has our capitalization rate evidence that we've gone through and page 13 has our non-recoverable expense sampling. Um, so again this, this is going to be a supplementary assessment is going to be sent out for this one but we feel the assessed value of 4,080,000 is uh, fair and equitable. Yes, on the, can you turn to your page 10? Yeah. So we're getting a, an income expense rate. Did you look at any uh, expense mailers previous to this one, like going back a few years? I um, mean, you know, I did. I, I don't exactly recall them. I didn't bring them in today, so. Did you notice that there's like on this page 10 that they, uh, they're stating 81% vacancy? Did you look back to see how the vacancy was on this property? Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't exactly remember the vacancy okay. of this property. But you made no adjustment if there was a common vacancy. We just use the computer generated numbers. We're using the uh, the six percent vacancy. Rate, yes. Okay. <coughs> and did you turn to page four. Is there any reason why there's so many premise IDs? Like it seems like they've chopped the building up and. Yeah, uh, I think it's been expect, inspected um, uh, a few other times before. And well, I guess if we look at the, the mailer here, we can see that. It's broken up here into two different premises, so 10,000 and 2,000. Um, I guess we haven't been in that building in a while, so probably some changes need to happen to the premises, but you can see that for such a large building, they do break it up into smaller spaces, so. But you haven't been in the building to see your clients, right? No. Okay, that's it for my questions. Mr. Whitbread? No questions, thank you. Ms. Nesbitt? I do, and I'm sorry, I'm on page four. Mm -hmm. So, I'm looking at your potential rent. You have two different numbers there for your potential rents. One at 383 and one at 476. Ah, so, I'm just, now when I work through the numbers, the vacancy is based on that 476, so then that suggests to me that the rest of the workup is probably based on that too. Yep. But, That's um, now I, now I'm not really confident in how, how that works. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. I think this is yeah. Well, maybe I, I'm not reading this properly, but. Glad you're here today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, four forty-eight. Less your expenses and your shortfall does not get you to 338 for your NOI. Well, for that matter, if I look at the so blended I'm kind rate of is. now the blended rate gets you to 383. <clears throat> yeah, but, but look at the individual rate uh, rents. Where am I? Yeah, all of them. They are all substantially, except for one, higher than 592. So you sort of think that the 383 okay, number is wrong and there might be, 476 and that is correct? Could, and that could be if you need just to. Them. But even, Mark, if you take that potential rent of 476, less vacancy is that. 
less than two percent, and the shortfall does not get you to three thirty eight. Mm -hmm. Hundred and ten thousand dollars difference. And I don't really know what's going on. Dang, those computers. Mm -hmm. So when I add these up, they come to four seventy six. Yeah, when I add those up, those come to four seventy six. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. And that could be, but then yeah. go but then further down to your effective gross income. That's four forty eight. Yeah, we're, I'm gonna work my way through this here quickly. Yeah. So this number's wrong. So that's good. But it's rent for self and serve. Yeah, because the three, uh, 48 and 15 is right. Now do the expense. It's not that. It's not wrong again. Hmm. Which one? 2%. Mm -hmm. The 2% is wrong. Yep. It should be 8,000 and a half. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. what I got to. Yeah. Actually, I punched it through, and it seems like if you use, it, if you use the 373 uh, as the total rent, you get, you get that net operating income of 338606, unless I made a mistake. Yeah, well, I don't know. <coughs> I don't know which one it is. And the, only, the, only, right here. the only thing I'm getting wrong here is that 2%. I got the 2 How is the shortfall calculated? It's like the percentage of the vacancy, so. Okay. Does it work if we use that um, potential rent of 383? Uh, well, I guess it, it's not it's what not it adds up to. Yeah, no. I checked it too. Unless you, we check all the math within that. Yeah, so the uh, yeah, we can work we can work it back with the 383. That's right. Which is probably what I'm going did. from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. So the 476612 is the right number. Right. But obviously, Which it's not the right number. So. 
it's not helping us with that. Yeah. So I can't unfortunately speak to that at this okay. point. So. Okay. So we'll go with your, your bottom number. We'll go with the bottom number okay. of 4 million. Where were we? <laughs> <laughs> questions. We're on questions that was my question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There is actually a 2018 municipal board pending. So if you turn the page, you'll see uh, on the when we first purchased the property after Canada Cartage moved, uh, the picture on the left is when he was installing new LED lights. I mean, he's, he's put some money into the place to try to make it marketable, to try to get someone in there to rent that space. So he put all the LED lights in there. All those walls uh, were all power washed. You had a guy in there for like a month power washing everything, cleaning everything up because it, uh, uh, it was in really bad shape. He had all the walls painted. He's replaced some of the lumber inside. He's just trying to make it look a little nicer. And you'll see uh, the picture on your right is the loading area underneath the two-story portion of the building. So if you turn to page one, those loading doors that you see facing Gomez underneath the actual office space, that's the picture on page two on the bottom there. So you can see a little hand dolly there. You can basically just go to a truck and pull out uh, pallets and move them into the warehouse space. <clears throat> turn to page three. Uh, this is one of the tenants who was in there uh, for a while, uh, for a year. And usually, if you're renting space, the shorter period of time you rent space, the more you're going to pay for it. So basically, it's a gross lease. Uh, and he was paying, uh, the Manitoba company, numbered company, was paying uh, $3.90 gross per foot. You turn the page, the next page, I've gone into some sales, I've looked at sales on the property that would be comparable to the property if it's sold. And first one is 1586 uh, wall and it's sold. And it sold for 31.57 per square feet in July of 2016. And you can see it's a, it's, it's a nice looking building. And it's obviously it's in a better location, it's got a large parking area around it. So if you use that number with the subject property, uh, 64,700 square feet, that would be our building, the subject would be worth 2 million, 2 million 42,000. Uh, Aikens, below that is a large uh, warehouse, uh, very extremely high ceilings, uh, storage compound. Uh, it's sold for a little bit more in September of 2017. So if you're using the subject square footage at uh, 64,700, uh, you get two million three hundred thousand. Uh, below is two fifty five Hutchings, which is obviously off in the Inkster area. Uh, nice office space in the front, and that's a large warehouse, eighty one thousand square feet. Uh, it sold for thirty nine thirty two square foot in July twenty one of twenty sixteen. Uh, apply that rate to the subject property, you get two million five forty four. You turn the page again. You'll get 1551 Church Avenue, which has a, a lot of office space and uh, uh, a large warehouse attached to it. And with the more office space you have, the more you're going to get for the property, obviously. Uh, you can rent that office space out to someone else to get income or use it yourself. That sold for 42.52 in February 20th, 2018. So that makes sense it would sell for more since it's got all that office and it's all cinder, uh, cinder block. Um, uh, Tindallstone uh, exterior, that's a nice building. And so if you apply that to the subject property, you'd get 2751000 So I averaged out those sales since some buildings are better than others. And the average comes up at 3724 square foot, which would make the subject property in not as good location, not as good building, at 2409000 So then I looked at some rent comparables. Now, first one, 555 Logan, is one that's uh, used by the assessors a lot. That's actually Western Glove, which is a really nice building, and that's at 395. Uh, 1000 Henry is another one the uh, assessors use, that's at 350. 1201 Region is a huge building opposite uh, the Chevy dealer, it's a metal building. Uh, that's, uh, they call it multiple uh, tenants, it's such a large building they could divide up. They want four for that. Uh, the Aikens building is 450. It's got a nicer look, uh, uh, lots of high windows, metal exterior. 1670 Inksters in the Inkster Park area. That's a nicer building. It's newer. Uh, 74 and 39 Mountain is 295. And the Burroughs is at 450. So you get an average of about 402 a square foot. So you turn the page. The building hasn't had a lot of vacancy. In fact, since the uh, Canada Carters left, it's been vacant uh, 
pretty much vacant for a few tenants coming in and out all the time for probably about three years now. So at 402, and because of the vacancy, uh, high vacancy, I've applied a 10% uh, vacancy rate to it, which isn't much. I've used the 375 shortfall, expenses 2%, and the city's 8.3% capitalization rate to get 2,528,000. So we've got the valuation from the comparable sales is 2.4, comparison rent, which is high, at 2.5, because of the location of the building. And if you turn the page, I'm going to go through the income expense mailer, which is on the uh, two pages, sorry, I didn't number, uh, two pages in, if you go to the income expense mailer, you find it. As you'll see at the bottom there, there's general administrative recoveries at 106,427. I kind of scratched my head when I saw that. I'm looking, well, general admit, annual expenses for general administration is at like 7742. 16 for management and $332 for professional fees. And I kind of threw me out going, like, what's going on here? So go back two pages to the emails. So on September 25th, I kind of sent an email to the owner. I says, I'm going over the income expense for Gomez. Just checking. Covert Logistics is paying $14,919 per month occupying 10,000 square feet. I said, that works out to a gross rent of $17.90, plus you're recovering an additional 106 for general expenses, another 1064, which makes the rent now 2854. I said, is that all right? If it is, it's amazing. Owner calls, shoots it back to me, says, no covert is out. At 100 Hagens, they had a lease. That's the truck service garage I was talking about, $5,000 per month. It says, any additional rent for 47 Gomez is where they are renting space on a temporary basis. 23,000 square feet. We got blank in the end and we were suing them for 80 grand. So then I sent them another thing and I sent them the, that income expense mailer. It says, this is what Tracy filled out for Gomez. Is this right? He goes, incorrect. So if you turn the page, what had happened was at the top, miscellaneous income 106,427. That was the final re release recovery from Direct Limited Canada Cartage. And that goes back to 2016. They owed the owner of that money back to 2016, which was some rent and some miscellaneous expenses on the property. That's what, how that got in there. So I asked the secretary about that, and she sent a message back to the owner myself, and she basically said, the last paragraph, the 106.427 in question on the 2017 ID Form was for the full and final release of direct limited Canada cartridge from 47 Gomez, 92 Higgins, 100 Higgins, and 34 McDonald. Those are the four properties that they occupied when the owner, present owner bought the whole package. Shindico was selling it as a big package, those four properties, because that's what Canada cartridge was using for the last 10 years before he purchased it. So that was what they, that's what they owed when they left the owner for damages, repairs and maintenance, and for rent that they uh, required to pay. So unknowingly, when she got that check, she posted it to 47 Gomez <coughs> because that was the main address for Canada College. That shouldn't have been included. That was going back to 2016 money they owed for that, for damages and unpaid rent and stuff way back in 2016. It has nothing to do with 17, 18. So I removed that. Plus they're paying $5,000 a month for the service garage. So if you turn the page to the uh, 2017 income expense mailer, in the bottom there's some calculations. So if you take covert lo uh, logistics, if you take the 14,919.44, they're supposedly paying for rent in there. They weren't, they're, they're leasing 23,000 square feet by the email. And they were basically paying $5,000 uh, at the 100 Hagens, the service garage I was talking to. So the actual rent they were paying is $9,919.44. That's at the bottom. At 23,000 square feet, that works out to a gross rent of five eighteen. dollars Now, to Tom, this is the, they're renting some office space upstairs, so not a lot. And they're paying $9 gross. And the vacant space is 38200 So I applied this exact same rent that Covert Logistics was paying at 518 gross. 
So the rent was removed that they're paying at the service garage to come down with actually what they were paying here and how much space they were leasing. So if you turn the page, you'll see I'm using the actual net rent is $3.40. I'm using a 10% cap rate, the shortfall capitalization rate, and I get $2,114,000. And I think that's what the property is worth due to its location and the condition of the building. And basically, if you're looking at my comparable sales, uh, far nicer buildings, far nicer office space, a lot more office space. And from the comparable sales, uh, we're getting a value of basically 2.4 million. So for 2.1 million, 300,000, you're looking at some of these comparables for the amount of office space they have and where they are. Uh, it's logical that that's what it should be worth. So I'm asking the board to reduce it to 2,114,000. And remember that basically the department on their computer program raised the income on this place by 63%, which for being on Higgins, I think is excessive. And that's my presentation. Questions? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of your uh, comparison approach, you are using the exact sales per square foot for each, applying it to the subject property, you Correct. made you made zero adjustments. Correct. So when doing the comparison approach, usually we would make adjustments, would we not? Such as time adjustments. The time is too short to adjust. You can't adjust for a few months or a year. Well, you have two sales that are in 2016. Well, the sales I have are July 2016 <coughs> and July 2017, and then another six months. So you're talking about a year and a half. And as far as properties are selling uh, within a year, year and a half. Uh, you, you would feel there'd be no increase in sales in a year and a half. Well, actually, I've seen properties go down actually in a year and a half. Well, and besides, the other thing is, is it's all hypothetical to come up with an adjustment when every building is different. If you're looking back on sales and it's a year, year and a half old, that's a pretty good sale. So, sorry, you're saying this is hypothetical? You're well, you're, if you're doing a time adjustment. If you're doing a time adjustment, uh, to calculate a time adjustment, you can't. Things just don't go up every six months a year. Properties are for sale. Big properties like this are for sale for years. I mean, you just look at the 1300 St. James. That was for sale like three years. And it actually sold for less than what they're asking for. And that one, by comparable sales, was right on to what they paid. What about size? Did you use economies of scale at all? Because you have two buildings here that are quite a bit larger than the subject property. No, I'm just using those. I'm relying on, the, on what I calculate as income. This is just to show and these buildings are all nicer than the subject property because they have a lot more office space. So you'd have to do a, an adjustment for how much office space these comparables have as compared to the subject. Comparables to the subject has a very small second floor office space. If you look at 15 to 86 wall, it's got office space on the main floor. If you look at the uh, other comparable on uh, Hutchin Street, they've got a light, nice uh, office on the main floor. So for and your, if you're looking at 1551 Church Avenue, it has main floor and second floor so office. So you're relying then on your income approach? Then. I'm re relying on the income approach uh, with comparables as far as what things are renting for and relying on some uh, sales approach to show that it's basically in that, they're all within that area. I mean, when you're looking at the three approaches, you're basically looking at Two, uh, 2.4, 2.5, the rent comparisons, and 2.1. They're all pretty tight. So, did, sorry, I, I meant this. So, you stated for your income approach, your net rent is $3.40 per square foot, and that's based off the lease that's in there right now. It's the actual lease? That's correct. And they've gone. Like, the building is now, uh, Cobra Logistics is gone. So, if you want to talk about today. Uh, so, I'm just saying, so you base it on a month to month lease? I'm basing it on a month to month lease. A month to month leases are typically higher. Then when you sign a lease, because if you sign a lease for one year, it's going to be higher, higher than if you sign for 10. You sign a five-year or 10-year lease, you're going to get a break because the owner knows you're going to be there for that amount of time. So He's got you, the, that income coming for a number of years instead of just so one. Then you use rent comparables with an average that's higher at $4.02 per square foot. Correct. Um, and then, but we know, well, we know 1309 Mountain, it, it didn't exist at 43000 for a rent comparable at 295 We've already gone over that one. Um, would you agree that the Logan and Henry location are inferior locations to the subject property? Uh, the Logan property is uh, 555 Logan? Mm -hmm. 
That's Western Globe. Do you know what Western Globe looks like? That's a beautiful building. I know the area, though. That's a beautiful building. Well, yeah, you're saying that that area is not that uh, Higgins? <clears throat> I'd say I'd rather be on Logan than on Higgins. All right, those are all my questions. Mr. Whitbread. No questions, thank you. Um, just a question about, um, am I correct in understanding that you're asserting that a building that has a fair bit of office, a warehouse that has a fair bit of office, is going to be more attractive than one that does not have the fair bit of office? Correct. And if, you, if you're running a big company and you need to have an office space to have all your employees, whether it's shipping or you're taking orders in or things like that, so obviously office space rents for more than warehouse space. So even if you didn't use the office, you could rent it out. And so then, therefore, you would probably conclude that an agent who was saying the opposite, that a fair bit of office space makes a warehouse a bit of a boat anchor, uh, that would not be correct? It's actually more attractive in the market to have that? To have more office? Well, of course, because you get more income from more office. And as fact, as we're getting to this, as you saw by the emails, that COVID logistics is go are gone. Uh, presently, uh, there's one tent in that building today. Second floor. The place is empty again. It's 100% vacant except for 2,000 square feet upstairs. That, that owners, being the office. That being the office. The owner's tried everything. He's, he's power washed that space. He's cleaned it. He's washed. He's put LED lighting in it. It's just nobody, when you have the, when you have the choice, if you were to, I mean, it's a large building. So, I mean, a company that's a shipping company, to have them pick church or industrial, the Inkster Industrial Park area, or this building, for basically the same kind of money, you're not going to take this building. I mean, it's hard to get the trucks in. You get Inkster, it's an industrial park. It's designed for semi-trailers. I mean, it's two lanes going each way down Inkster, King Edward to the airport, shipping. It's designed for that. This building is basically becoming obsolete in its area. And what he's had to do is he's, he's trying to let, let, rent out smaller chunks of it, somehow divide it up to get someone in there. You got Covert in there, and basically Covert stiffed them for 80 grand. Now he's seen them for 80 grand. OK, that's all my questions. That takes care, then, of 47 Gomez. Does that leave us with, uh, let's see, we have 34 McDonald's withdrawn. 376 Donald Street withdrawn. 44 Princess. We're. I'll oh, we accept doing? the recommendation. Yeah, um, I'll just quickly go through it. <laughs> uh, the roll number is 130600445004 Princess. We have an assessed value of 1,210,000. If you look down to the recommendation, there is a residential portion to this property, and then the, uh, obviously the, uh, the loft warehouse portion. Um, we are, and there was land value on this, and when I looked at it, I, I could not figure out why there was land value on it, so if you want to quickly look at the pictures, on page 10, you can see what the building looks like, page 11, you get an aerial view, um, there is no excess land um, anywhere, so I'm not too sure how this is put on there, so we are going to be removing the $14,000 from, the, it was on the residential income stream, so there are two income streams. If you look at page five, or I guess six is a better summary, you can see them together. And then if you look all the way to the bottom, there's a, an adjustment for $14,000. We will be removing that. And um, so that creates a, uh, a new value of $1,196,000. And that is acceptable. Any questions? No. Mr. Whitford? No, thanks. Not for me either. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Four o'clock. Oh, I should probably renew my drinking. Okay.